along the way making Serum, I, I thought, wow, I think this is really working. I'm actually having fun every time I open up the prototypes. You know, I'm really having fun. Like I get lost making presets in a sense. And then I thought, you know, I bet, I wonder if once this is out, if people will make their first ever bank of patches for a synth. And that happened to a bigger degree than I ever expected. Um, obviously, the popularity happened to a bigger degree. But I also think that that was sort of a feedback loop, that all these people making presets for Serum were, in essence, advertising Serum. And I've never advertised Serum once, uh, you know, um, short of maybe talking about it on stuff like this. Welcome to the Mr. Bill Podcast. I'm Bill's manager and emergency contact, Anand Harsh, which I get the sense will come in handy as his mountain biking obsession overtakes his kombucha obsession. Bill's guest today is truly a renaissance man. Steve Duda is not only a multi-instrumentalist and vocalist, but he's also a programmer. He worked on Nine Inch Nails' seminal third album, The Fragile, which puts him in the company of Steve Albini, Adrian Ballou, and Dr. Dre. He's also a longtime collaborator and friend of last week's guest, Dead Mouse. But if you're an electronic music producer, and especially if you're in the bass music field, get down on your knees and prepare to worship at the feet of the creator of the VST Serum. That's right, Steve Duda is your rightful king and daddy. A reminder to pre-order Blanket Dragon's EP Nothing Isn't, which is out this Friday, December 18th, on Bill's Bleagle Beats label. If you're unfamiliar, Bleagle Beats is dedicated to left field glitch and IDM, and it's more than a year and a half of quality releases under its belt. Bill's collab with Blanket Dragon Life in Reverse is out now as an instant gratification download if you pre-order the EP. Go to BeleagleBeats.com for more info on the label. Thank you for supporting the show on Patreon. We had a bunch of new patrons join the family recently, so thank you for that. You're going to get early access to episodes, exclusive tutorials, and some weird shit because we like doing weird shit for the patrons. Finally, please head over to MrBillsTunes.com to sign up to become a hardcore Abletoneer. You get full access to Bill's project files, access to nearly 30 sample packs, and so much more. All right, here's Bill's double-stuffed holiday-sized chat with Steve Duda. Hey, you're listening to the Mr. Bill Podcast. Hey, you're listening to the Mr. Bill Podcast. Hey, you are listening to the Mr. Bill Podcast. Hey, you're 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 listening to the Mr. Bill Podcast. cool man well um yeah awesome uh glad glad to have you on the podcast i was um been meaning to get you on for a while now and yeah it's just crazy that it happened so quickly i just hit up joel and was like hey what's what's uh what's up with getting steve on the thing and then like you know 30 minutes later we're doing it <laughs> you got to talk to his agent i don't know right uh. <laughs> yeah that's the classic thing i've had I actually had that quite a bit with the podcast where people are like oh you have to you have to hit up my manager about that. And then it just like puts a six month wall in between the doing the thing. I'm constantly shocked at how managers just seem to interfere. And basically it seems like they're harming the productivity and progress of their client. You know what I mean? It's like, um, you'd think they'd have a vested interest to have things happen. But <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I think like a lot of it comes down to like the look of what you're doing, right? Like for instance, I'm, um, uh, you know, like they don't want their artists doing things that look too cheap or shabby. And, you know, they, they only want people to you know be punching up, so to speak, I guess. And yeah, it's sensible. I mean, I'm kind of more of the take of there's no such thing as bad press. I mean, watching watching Joel in particular, where he would kind of put himself out there talking trash about various things. I mean, calling it as he saw it, really, you know what I mean? But it all it ever did was broad attention you know what i mean all if people are talking about you then that's like that's kind of what you want right so i don't know i i think it's kind of silly to gatekeep uh that kind of stuff i don't know it's i mean i guess there's a waste of time sort of a thing but i don't know at least i'm i'm of the mindset that there's no such thing really as like bad press i mean 
I remember there was there was a thing with Serum and uh, Kanye. I don't know if you remember that or uh, no, I or never heard of any this. wind of that. But um, basically, huh, when was this? Probably like 2016. Joel and I were doing like a bus tour uh, for his label, and so we were in Philadelphia, like sitting in a hotel lobby, and he's like, "Dude, dude, check it out." And he like holds up his phone. I wasn't like on my phone. I was just spacing out, looking at the art on the walls or whatever. And he's like, check it out. And he holds up his phone to me and it says like uh, Pirate Bay X for, you know, and I was like, <laughs> what's that? Like what? Pi yeah, I know my stuff's on Pirate Bay. You know, I can't stop that. He's like, Kanye just tweeted that. And I'm like, what? Oh, wow. I pick up my phone and it was something I've never seen where it's like the at things lit up and I'm just scrolling like pages <laughs> ever. Sue Kanye, Sue Kanye, Sue Kanye. I'm like, oh, what in the hell? And then your rides here. We had to, we we're playing in some club in Philadelphia where there was no Wi-Fi and no cell signal because it was like this basement place. And and so I'm sitting there for like hours of this show, just wondering, knowing that shit's blowing up, but not, you know not being able to even like look at it. And mm. so that was pretty funny, but um, it turned into this just huge thing. And then Joel put himself out there and was sort of like, what the fuck, Kanye? Like can't afford <laughs> two, you know, $200 software like or whatever. And, um, and then Kanye started digging into Joel and making all these jokes about mouse head or whatever. And, um, and then I was sort of like, man, thanks for like sticking up for me or whatever. He's like, you kidding me? I just gained like 200,000 followers, <laughs> you know? So, uh, yeah, it doesn't really hurt if people are talking trash about you, especially if it's someone of that level of... Right, yeah. Stuff. Yeah, I think anyone, like most artists would pay to have Kanye talk shit about them on their Twitter. That's right. I mean, I felt really victimized at, victimized at the time from the thing, like in the moment of it, because I'm like, you might know this from like Silent, for instance, right? Like it had a username on the interface and then people would like crack the software and put like their crack team name yeah, on the like software. Team Air or whatever. Yeah. And then all these like different DJs and people would do a tutorial or be in the studio and then people would call them out for oh, it. Oh, yeah. So Carnage when, that was like the big one, right? For that? That's right. I yeah. think Avicii, Steve Aoki. I think there was John Dahlbeck. There was a few mm. people that kind of got in this controversy over it, even though some of them were like, hey, I just I bought it. I'm just using the crack because I like the weird skin they made or, or whatever. <laughs> um, and so, uh, yeah, so I want, didn't want that with Serum. I was like, you know, I don't want to dissuade people from making tutorials. I don't want like the this like faux controversy and then you get dragged into that. So I intentionally left nothing on the interface so that people would, you know, so there would be none of that controversy ultimately. Um, and then little did I know, you know, some, someone's going to photograph a browser tab of a torrent. You know? <laughs> uh, so I was like, ah, oh, geez. So I felt like a victim, but then developers were hitting me up, DMing or whatever. Dude, congratulations. Like you can't pay for that. And then my web admin hits me up. He's like, dude, jackpot, SEO gold mine. And I'm like, what? He's like, you know, SEO, right? Oh yeah. Search engine optimization. Um, yeah, what about it? He's like, well, the way it works is like when reputable websites link to your site, that's what really boosts it. So now Wired and Huffington Post and, and Gadget and Financial Times of India and all these people were like contacting me for a quote and and linking to X for records on their pages. So all of a sudden serum, which, of course, is a word used for face tonics and and the medical stuff, all of a sudden, instead of being page four on Google, if you type serum, it became kind of the top thing. So mm. does that matter? I don't know. <laughs> but um, it definitely brought a lot of like traffic and attention. And so, yeah, no such thing as bad publicity. Speaking I of guess. like pirated stuff, uh, has there been anything where you've like had to sue anyone? Or is that like even a thing you would bother doing or could do? Or like, how does that work with the with the whole plugin thing? I mean, I go way back with music and audio software. And so I, you know, admittedly have downloaded illegal stuff when I was young and broke, you know what I mean? So it's always been something that I kind of feel like I can see both sides of. It's like um, there's a legality and there's a morality side to it. Um, but I wouldn't sue anyone just based on the letter of the law. I think that's like really... <sighs> I mean, you'd have to really do something like try to sell 
serum, like edit the interface and pretend it's yours or something like that. I, it would take a lot for me to like want to go to court and deal with lawyers. And obviously there's a lot of payment. I've only once sued someone and that was for a house I bought where they didn't disclose that it was basically a danger to life and property because it was perched <laughs> on a hillside in LA. And turns out that they they knew stuff about it they didn't tell me. And like, so- Like uh, um, earthquake related stuff probably? Or? Yeah, there was, an, there was a letter from the architect who built the house saying, warning, this is a threat to life and property. There were 16 houses and in the Northridge quake, 12 of them came down. Yours is one of four left. A girl died in one of them. Oh, that empty lot next to you? Yeah, that was a twin house. Damn. And uh, and so they knew this and then they, they lied to me about it. Basically, they said, oh, some lady's going to come by like after I close. They're like, oh, some lady's going to come by and say your house isn't safe. But don't worry, your house is perfectly safe. I'm like, what are you talking about? And they're like, oh, <laughs> this lady, she's crazy. She got drunk and tried to sue us. And But just don't worry, your house is safe. And then sure enough, this lady comes by, yoga pants, BMW. She's like, um, did they give you this letter? I'm like, no, but I kind of knew this was coming. And she was <laughs> like, I was like, they said that you got drunk and tried to sue them. And she's like, oh, that's funny because I'm a vegetarian and I don't drink. <laughs> you know, so, so I was just, I just wanted to get out of the whole deal. I was like, take the house back. And they're like, no, we're not going to take the house back. And I was like, all right, well, we're going to court. And so it was a slap on the wrist to them. I, you know, I just wanted some recourse because of morality thing, partly. Right. And I was broke and couldn't address the issue. Um, but yeah, in general, no, suing is like awful. Like I've seen people, you know, be victim of semi-frivolous lawsuits a number of times over the years, people suing uh, artists claim, you know, with like delusion saying, I came up with that song idea and like, you know, trying to sue in like frivolous ways. And Yeah, it seems uh, like the only people who win in court are like the lawyers, right? Exactly, <laughs> exactly. In fact, I don't even usually do contracts with people. I'm like, let's just have a common understanding here. And if we both agree and have good faith, and hope for the best. Now, obviously, I'm not suggesting people avoid contracts, but um, for me, what's most important is that people have a common understanding. And if you have common understanding, then the odds that you end up in court, it's kind of unrelated to whether there's wet ink on a document, you know, so I don't know. Mm. Yeah, crazy. I mean, I, I imagine with something like Serum, um, a bunch of strange stuff would come up, though, because it's just like such a popular thing at this point in the music industry. Um, for instance, like a new plugin just came out recently. I had the guy on the podcast, um, Matt Titel, who makes a synth called Vital, which right. is uh, quite serum like. Like when using Vital, like I noticed a lot of what I was comparing it to when I was first using it was serum. And I feel like that's kind of what I do with like any new plugin now. I'm kind of like, how is this like serum? <laughs> right. Well, I think a, there's a couple decent analogies I could use. One would be like Behringer right and they are a hardware company as of date i guess they're getting into the software world but um they basically go up against the letter of the law in copying cloning various like hardware devices and so there's legality and then there's morality right and so i think um I, you know, I would never sue anybody or do anything just because I felt it was a legal, valid thing to do. Like, I'm not a gatekeeper. I'm not interested in, like, maximizing money. And I think that's sort of the Behringer way. They're just out to make a bunch of money and skirt the law by just staying right within where they feel legally able to do. Um, and morality matters a lot more to me, right? So I feel like I would almost sue and hypothetically if something felt to me to be morally egregious rather than whether or not I could even win. Um, because it's to me, it's, uh, you know, there's it's sort of a matter of principle type thing. Right. And so I would only do something like I said, if someone literally took serum, hacked the interface, tried to claim it's some plugin that they made. Or there's websites that sell cracks. And I think that that's really disgusting. Right. Like it's like. Mm -hmm it's piracy the kind of the point is to not pay for things and so when people sell serum on these you know buy free vsts.com whatever the hell it's called you know whatever they make i think that that's a little um morally egregious right it's like profiteering from piracies seems pretty horrible to me 
Um, as for like clone, Im, you know, imitation, I think that's all like a, it's a little bit of a blurred line, right? Between what's inspiration and what's imitation and what's like just direct ripoff kind of a thing. Mm. Um, and I don't really feel like I'm the best person to kind of make that sort of decision. You know what I mean? Like, so it's like if I, if I just clearly felt like someone was very clearly just profiteering off of my work, then that's, um, I, you know, I think there's a threshold in there. I don't know what it is, but it's as also, for Vital, which I finally got around to checking out, I think like, um, obviously I wish there was things that were a little less one-to-one -one with Serum so that people wouldn't just directly compare it to Serum. Because at the end of the day, once I actually used it, I'm like, this really isn't Serum. Like, it has a lot of face plant ripoff in it too. I, I kind of feel like on interface stuff and it feels like sonically, it doesn't really touch serum. Like it, uh, is it better in ways? Maybe, is it worse in ways to me? Maybe, yeah, right. But it's different. Like ultimately I think the sounds you get out, is there overlap? Of course, but is, but to me, it's sort of like, I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't call it a, a, a you know, direct, it's not taking my code. It, it has a different mm. quality to it, I think. And so. Also, the, um, like people yeah. need access to things, right? It's kind of like um, with music copyright as well. Um, like no one can do like a one, four, five chord progression and say like you ripped off anyone else, right? Because everyone needs access to that chord progression because it's just such a sort of universally enjoyed thing. Um, and like four, four time signature, like no, no one can like take that from anyone else and call it their property because it's like just such a, again, universally enjoyed thing. So everyone needs like access to certain things. And I think with like plugin design, you could almost say that like with Serum and Vital and Phase Plan and just like the way that these synths are kind of laid out, it's like the access to the layout is almost necessary because there's no real better way as far as we know to lay out a plugin. Yeah. I mean, there's this sort of imitation is flattery thing, right? When you say like, oh, this person couldn't come up with a better way to do it than the solution that I feel I invented. Mm. Uh, everything is, of course, incremental advancement. So I didn't invent too much in Serum, right? Like not, And I wouldn't, I wouldn't patent stuff anyway, because I do feel like openness was a part of my whole thing in making Serum when I was like, I want to make a wavetable synth. Oh, I need some wavetable source because there was no editor and all that yet. And then I started looking at the wavetables out there, and they were all proprietary file formats. And I was like, you know what? Serum's going to have an open file format. So if people want to take Serum wavetables to any any other synth, any other usage, even if it's someone making a, a Me Too product based on Serum, uh, people should have that access. So I wanted to do it really for the users. My whole mindset when it comes to music software is is creator focused, right? Like musician centric. That's where I come from. That's my background. And that's my passion. I, I make this stuff not to make money. Ultimately, it's to empower musicians. So yeah, so and, in, in, you know, in, in a plugin that's inspired from Serum, empowering musicians is not a bad thing to me. And in fact, yeah, there's a flattery side to that as well. It's like, oh, wow, you, you thought my design here, you know, this design element, that design element, you couldn't come up with a better way. So that makes me feel good. Like, that um but what of course isn't feel good is if people go that this is the new like it's such and such oh, yeah. as the new serum whether Everyone it's like or calls things a pi serum pi killer pigments, or whatever. i think has a lot of serum influence um vital etc i just you know to me these things are all musical instruments and unless you really you can capture some things and replace something for some things but i think ultimately to me at least um there's a lot in Serum already, and there's a lot coming for Serum that I think nothing can really hold a candle to. Hmm. Uh, whether whether or not that matters for everyone is a different story, or whether or not something else might be superior for someone's type of music is another story. But when I was making Serum, I thought of it like uh, guitars, right? So uh, my thesis, in a sense, was everyone already owns Massive. Like ma Obviously, Serum was influenced in parts from Massive and seeing my peers using Massive. But then I thought, like, um, everyone already owns Massive. Therefore, I don't need to try to do everything that Massive does. Um, if you are a guitar nut, you're going to get a Telecaster and a Stratocaster and a Les Paul and an acoustic, et cetera, right? Like, they, they all have overlap. But, you you know, as if you get into it, you're going to kind of want the whole collection. You're going to realize, oh, this is the one I turn to for this or this is the one I turn to for that. 
Um, so that's how I like to think of instruments. And ideally, that's how I'd like all instrument designers to think a little bit. It's not just a list of features. Um, you know, if you want every possible feature, your reactor or something at a certain point, and now that takes creators into some place they might not want to be. So I think there's room for a lot of a lot of stuff that doesn't try to do everything. And I don't think Serum ultimately is just a list of features. Um, it's it's the quality of the filters. It's, um, you know, all of the things unique to it. Um, what is and, it that and, makes a filter like specifically good it's a little subjective different people want different things right you could do it from a very clinical measurement point of view or or sometimes it's the things that aren't right about it that actually make it good i mean it reminds me of like analog gear a lot of the flaws are actually what make a piece of gear unique in a sense um it's like like compressors right people don't just want the most clinical sterile compressor that's just technically doing the thing they want, want something that almost imparts a little bit of its own color onto the signal. And um, there's a time and a place for clinical as well. But so I think that, um, yeah, I think of it a little bit more in that way. And then it reminds me a bit of music as well. Like you could say, I was touring around with Skrillex on this bus tour in 2011, right when I was kind of starting the idea for Serum or revisiting, because I had the kind of an older wavetable synth back from a decade prior. Um, and Zomboy was just blowing up at that time. And Zomboy obviously had this like Skrillex influenced sound, one could mm. say ripoff, right? And so I was really curious and I kind of like, you know, took, just couldn't resist asking Sonny. I was like, what do you think of Zomboy? Because I was just too curious, even though I felt like a troll even asking. But I was like, well, what do you think of Zomboy? And his answer really surprised me because even though he's a super positive guy, uh, I kind of expected him to be like, oh, well, what can you do or something? But he was like, He's like, actually, I really love Zomboy because he's actually doing it well. <laughs> and I was like, oh, my God, I didn't expect that reaction. Right. I expected him to be a, be a little bit of a whatever. To be like, he's taking it. something from me by doing this or whatever. Yeah. I mean, Sonny's all love. Like he loves he loves the idea of people. You know, it's that's always a, a weird idea, though. Right. When somebody does something that's very similar to you, whether it be in music or software or whatever. There is always this like underlying feeling or this knee jerk reaction feeling of like they're taking something from me by doing this thing. But if you actually like scrutinize that thought a lot, what you really end up coming to or what I end up coming to anyway is that like kind of a rising tide raises all ships. Like by having Zomboy also doing this, it like probably started somebody else doing it and so on and so forth. And now it's like Skrillex is, Skrillex is at the top of a much bigger pyramid than he was in 2011, you know. Yeah, and Dead Mouse as well. I mean, he kind of he kind of changed the sound of progressive house back when he blew up with Faxing Berlin and Not Exactly and all of his like early tracks that got him some attention. You know, if you were in a club and one of his tracks came in, it just jumped out at you. It was like, are we having a moment kind of a thing? Because everything was like perky 16ths in progressive house back then. And then he came in with these just wall of eighths, right? And it was just like, whoa, what's something's happening. And then people really started imitating that, but it makes you the originator, right? Like you said, it kind of, it's sort of like now a new genre is sort of brewing up and you're get, you get to be known as the innovator and king of it in a sense. So um, I think that happened for Skrillex. Absolutely. He became known as like, like the originator. And there's so, and I think there's a lot of respect that gets given by people on who, who is the one to really like take things in a new direction. Well, kind of the um, originator, but as you said before, like progress is always incremental, right? So it's like, he kind of yeah. took things, I think from noisier and, you know, old yep. school distance and like chest plate records stuff and when I stuff. yeah, when I met Sonny, it was like backstage at a show I was doing with Joel, like a BSOD show in the Nokia Theater in LA, and it, you know, no idea who he was. I didn't know his band, and he's just this this kid, this friend of Tommy Lee, who also came down to to, to the show, and then uh, and he was just like, yeah, man, I just got Ableton Live. You know, I do rock stuff, but I really I want to do what you guys do. And I'm just trying to figure out Ableton Live. And I was kind of like, good luck, kid. You know, like, <laughs> no idea. But then his girlfriend and my now wife girlfriend at the time kind of hit it off well. So they exchanged numbers and became friends. And so then he came over to dinner 
about a year later. And then he was like, yeah, man, can I play? You know, I've been working every day since I met you. Like, can I play you some of my stuff? And I was, you know, that feeling where you're kind of expecting it to be not that great and that you have to kind of like try to just be supportive. So a little begrudgingly like, oh, okay, yeah, sure. Let's listen to your stuff. And instantly I was like, oh, holy cow. Cause it was his, my name is Skrillex EP. That was, you had just finished it up. And I was just floored. I think I might have connected him and Joel. I can't remember, but I was, I was, uh, yeah, totally flabbergasted that this guy got, went from zero to hero in a year's time, <laughs> just spending 14 to 18 hours a day doing nothing but Ableton Live. Um, but yeah, he, but oh, when he originally, when I originally met him, he's like, you know, I really love like Aphex Twin and I really love like Noisia and I want to kind of like, you know, incorporate, go somewhere in between or something, which I was just like, well, that is so disparate, right? Aphex Twin, you know, and Noisia, just different worlds. But he actually, he kind of did that. Remember that time he posted Flim on his social media and everyone was like, where's the drop? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's like a really beautiful like piano, arm and breaky type Aphex twin tune, and like all the Skrillex fans are just like, what "The fuck is this? This sucks." <laughs> yeah. and he, I think he posted it saying like, "This is my favorite electronic tune of all time," or something like that. And yeah, yeah. Aphex. I, is... I, I love Sunny. I mean, he's like just you know being able to see see that you know it's happened a number of times in my life where I, you see someone with a vision and then when they execute it, I don't know. I'm. I don't mean to sound a little cynical, but I don't necessarily believe someone's going to pull it off when people are like, I have this idea. And you're kind of like, cool. But so many times now I've seen people that I wasn't really sure if they were going to pull it off, just like exceed my expectations. Avicii, I met when he was like 16 and a half or 17 and then watched him blow up. I mean, I would kind of mentor him on stuff like he's like how do i recreate this and he'd send me a sample and i'm like uh vibrato and he's like what's that like, uh, <laughs> lfo to pitch <laughs> um and uh and then zed a little bit i met him through sunny i mean it was his he had already done like a remix or two for we did one for joel and stuff so it wasn't a nobody but he was like yeah man i really want to blend like pop music because i just genuinely love pop music with like edm you know kind of like swedish house mafia did with save the world and all that and again i'm like cool kid good luck you know kind of thing and then watch him blow up how did all these people know you like why were all these people coming to you for the advice on how to make sounds and how to blend music styles and whatnot because this is like obviously pre-serum and whatnot so yeah it's a good question i mean i was doing plugins i may have had like lfo tool and, and nerve and stuff but i think it's largely because of joel um just people knew i was associated with him and i was kind of like um into the stuff. I can't say exactly who, but I think it's mostly just, you know, everything like connections lead to connections, right? Just like you and I today, like um, you would, you would have, if you were interested in having me, you would have had to like try to find a way to contact me or hit up extra contact form and hope it ends up to me, which actually does quite directly. But, um, but you, you know, Joel. And so it was like 30 seconds later, there we are chatting, right? So, um, that's, I mean, that's all it ultimately was, is like, I met Avicii through Star Killers, who were some, uh, producers in the scene way back then. And they had discovered him online. And so that's, it. so they were just like, this kid's going places kind of a thing. And so you know, credit to Nick from Star Killers for probably being the first American, at least to like see, uh, Tim's talent and recognize that. Yeah. Avicii was a crazy producer. He definitely like took music or electronic music to like a pretty uh pretty new place right like i don't think anyone uh, i don't know for instance like when i started electronic music right every every one of my friends who were basically all metal heads kind of just looked at it as like this joke and they were just like oh this is like some fucking mario kart gran turismo menu music shit like what the <laughs> fuck is that like metal is like where it's at obviously and like why are you even bothering with this stupid fucking toy music but right. then it's you know somebody like avici i'm sure had had like a similar experience and i mean at that time like that's kind of what electronic music was to some degree it was kind of like this weird like obscure thing that seemed cheaper than instruments and didn't seem as like polished or full or like as real. Um, but then, yeah, I mean, someone like Avicii comes along and turns it into like something that sounds like even cleaner and bigger and better and more polished and interesting and like poppy than, you know, a lot of instrumental band type music was at the time. 
kind of took it to a new place. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, Swedish House Mafia might have been a heavy influence on him. You know, it kind of seems like like being and same with Zed, right? Like being able to blend what you hear on the radio with pop music and then blend it with wanting to make something new and feeling like you're, you know, exploring new places and the club culture. I think Avicii understood even before he was old enough to get in the clubs. He kind of really understood how music serves this party uh, atmosphere in a sense or this or you know that it, it, it sort of has that function that it's music to dance to and and that kind of a thing so um yeah he was incredibly incredibly prolific i mean that was my that was the thing that i noticed about him kind of the most when i first got he was still yeah 17 i think and got in the studio with him and just watched him you know belt out two tracks in a sitting kind of a thing so he had this um yeah, crazy warp speed on FL Studio and uh, and uh, could just get ideas out to the speakers like nobody's business um, and and arrange and all that. Just very, very fast at it. And um, yeah, decent piano player, too. Uh, pretty good. And so I I think that. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's just, I don't know, circling back to the idea of like just people. I, I mean, because I mean, it might be biased, but to me, what's most striking is when people really have conviction in something and they believe in themselves. It seems to me that's almost like the identifying trait. If someone was to ask me, what's what's the common scene? Because I've known Joel also since he was, I think, 17, uh, maybe 18, but he was still living at home and um, doing the bedroom bedroom studio, so to speak. Right. And and so what it was the common thread between all these guys and it's really just conviction like they had they had they believed in themselves and they believed it was possible um and then obviously insane amount of hours um oh pro sec. probably other talent factors too but hold on one sec my uh Roomba just started trying to vacuum I'll turn it off <laughs> <laughs> Nice. Yeah, apparently every Sunday at this time it likes to do that. And I should probably turn that scheduling off. That's funny. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I agree. I think it's like when somebody just has like unstoppable drive with something, they'll usually kind of make it happen, right? It's sort of like probably you were with Serum or plugin development, right? It's like kind of you just have this feeling that you just want to grind on this every day until you can make sense of it. Otherwise, you're just going to keep leaving the experience of trying like frustrated and incomplete as a human being or whatever. Absolutely. Yeah, I guess it applies to myself as well. And um, I mean, the funny thing is I didn't, I mean, as you might imagine, I didn't expect to get nearly this far. I picked up C at the age of 30 and like I was like already, you know, making a living doing rock engineering, mixing records, um, and I just really picked it up, uh, partly just to sort of explore and see how far I could get sort of like a video game or something, uh, see how far I can get. Um, but I really felt that I would never, I would never make a living. Honestly, I never even thought I would get like a programmer salary. That was kind of the dream. I was like, Hey, if I want to get out of music or leave LA, I could live anywhere. I could live on the boat in the middle of the ocean and I could set up a little website and have people purchase things. And so I really like that idea because as a tradesman in LA working album to album, you had to be physically present. Um, mm. and all oh, that. Yeah, what do they call it? A digital vagabond? Digital vagabond. I like that. So yeah, I guess that's what I wanted to be and now kind of am. Yeah, there's a lot of those these days that go and like live in places like Bali and you know Thailand and stuff, places where it's like really beautiful or really cheap and they can just like do their job from anywhere so long as they have an internet connection. Yeah, that's me. I'm out here in the desert in Joshua Tree, and um, it's just wonderful. For the price of a small shoebox apartment in LA, I have 50 acres and a great house and um, solar power powering my you know house and car and everything. It's, um, it's the air is great. It's really quiet, beautiful hiking trails, etc. And uh, it's amazing that that's the equivalent price of like a miserable small apartment with you know noisy neighbors or whatever in the middle of la um but obviously a lot of people can't be out in the desert and subside on the you know live off the internet but um, mm. also I'm personality trait too right like some people just require that level of like human interaction and stuff like that 
Yeah, that's right. I mean, I've kept a place in LA and this whole year because of COVID, obviously there's less and less reason that you'd want to be in a city. Um, so for me, it's been very easy. My wife is a little more social, so it's been tough for her to, to be up here full time. Uh, but she's out, she's back in LA visiting her friends right now. So, um, yeah, I mean, ideally best of both worlds. I'm, I'm considering moving to Hawaii because, um, like you said, it's just, just beautiful and I can, I can make a living off the internet. And then my wife is, uh, doctor and so she can make a you know there's a shortage of doctors actually in hawaii they they need a lot so she could actually do quite well uh in medical there um so yeah i'm thinking about it or maybe half and half maybe keep this place in the desert and and kind of go back and forth um but for me personally i'm, a, I'm at the age where i'm kind of done with clubs and <laughs> concerts for the most part like i I don't feel so much uh, benefit from being in a place like Los Angeles. Ultimately, to me, it's my friends there and food food options, <laughs> mm. restaurants. That's about it. Otherwise, I'm I'm kind of done with being in a city. Yeah, it um, seems almost to me like LA is kind of a place you go to when you're trying to make it. Almost like it's a good place to be to connect with a lot of people and like you know make a lot of uh you know cool like do a lot of networking and make a lot of connections basically so you can get into the places you want to be in to do the kind of work you want to do because it's kind of like the media hub of the the planet right so it's kind of like you go there if you want to work in post on films or if you want to like be an actor or if you want to be a comedian or if you want to you know, yeah. work on records like a lot of bands are going there to record or if you want to whatever like do any of that sort of media driven stuff like animation or anything like that seems like the kind of place to be for that just in the same way that kind of uh living in san francisco where i live is sort of the place to be if you want to work in tech right yeah i'm from sf bay i grew up in menlo park and i used to live in san francisco and it's culturally pretty different as i'm sure you know you probably hear a lot of negativity about southern california up there at least that's sort of the the divide la less so they don't really talk trash about the bay but the bay tends to have a little bit of a negative uh connotation you know connotations of of la which and the people and culture but some of which might have a valid point but i think a lot of it not so much i moved uh la is a powerhouse i mean it really is it's and things happen just by being present absolutely and so it's one of those things where uh don't knock it till you try it partly and then also if you know you don't know what you're missing if you're not there because things happen just at a party and you you're just rubbing elbows with all sorts of different people. And there's a really nice attitude, which is pretty American kind of attitude of, yeah, man, let's shoot the shit. Let's talk. Like, let's like, what, what could we do? What could, what could be? And, and, um, and I love that kind of openness, um, to ideas and, and, uh, collaboration and that kind of a thing. Um, when I moved to LA, I had, uh, I think thousand dollars to my name and two phone numbers. And I just knew I wanted to do more work on more records. I just finished a Nine Inch Nails record and I knew that would be a good calling card since, you know, Nine Inch Nails is known for kind of technology in a sense. And sure enough, those two phone numbers led to album after album. And I was, you know, first week in LA, I'm riding around with Tommy Lee and Pam Anderson in the back <laughs> of their four by four, which is pretty surreal, like welcome to LA moment. But um, one of the phone numbers was the producer that was just starting his first solo album. So I jumped on that and did beats and synths for his uh, Methods of Mayhem record. And, um, and wow, yeah, it was just zero to 60 basically for me when I showed up in LA and, um, and there's, and like the whole, like, who do you, you know, who are you? What do you do? Who do you know? Kind of thing, which exists a bit in LA can be a little off putting maybe to some people, but for me, it was just great. Right. Because it's like, who are you? What do you do? Who do you know? I'm just like, well, I know nobody. And I just came off a Nine Inch Nails record. Oh, Nine Inch Nails. Oh, wow. Oh, you should meet my friend over here at the party that plays for Jane's Addiction. And all of a sudden you're talking to a guy in Jane's Addiction. And he's like, yeah, man, I'd like to do some like sample stuff. Your Pro Tools? Like, yeah, I want to do like a sample loop CD or something. Like, okay, great. Let's hang out and do that. Right. And so things, you know, I, I had no trouble finding work. Um, granted, I did things that I wouldn't want to do again, like tuning vocals for boy bands and <laughs> stuff like that. But I, I was just like, hey, if I'm running a computer and music's coming out and that's my job, then to me, that was kind of making it. I didn't have artist goals and dreams. Um, 
because back back then, you know, in late '90s or whatever, it really felt more like like you had Aphex Twin and people like that. But it really felt like you're either a pop singer or you're a band, like a rock band. And it and the making it as an electronic artist didn't feel quite viable like it is today. So yeah, now it's like yeah. almost the main one of the main things, right? It's like more producers than people on the planet. Is what I always say. Yeah, it can definitely feel that way, and it's super shifted. I mean, it went from back then it was maybe. 20,000 people making music on computers. And then maybe by mid, mid, mid knots, mid 2000s, it was maybe 40,000 people. And it just like exploded. And now I would guess it's five to 10 million, maybe more if you count super casual. Um, but it's hugely different because the bar of entry is gone now with processor speeds. You don't need sound cards and stuff like that and yeah like every computer these days comes with like some sort of audio editing software on it right like even if it's windows you still have like a some voice recording software or if it's you know apple you obviously get it stock standard with garage band which is like somewhat capable yeah i mean insane power for free it definitely like um or also just and- like phones and ipads right these days there's some crazy apps that you can download and like actually make a tune on like a five dollar app that's right. It's I, I don't, you know, I, I, yeah, I don't use phone like phones or iPads or stuff for music making. So it's still a little strange to me. I guess that's where I start feeling old or something where I'm like, I can't, I can understand it as a toy, but I can't like, I, but there's people seriously using iOS with all these different plugins Oh man, there's like plugins and stuff. full feature films that have been shot on iPhone and edited on iPhone these days and like full albums that have been made on an iPhone and stuff like that. It's pretty incredible. Yeah, that's amazing. I, to me, it feels like you're doing it the hard way or something. But, it seems uh, but that the way, tools but... are impressive. What like all the I've been, you know, I, I keep an eye on all music software, so I, I'm aware of all the various stuff out there for iOS, and it, and it shocks me how much creative, interesting stuff, and strangely not ported to desktop a lot of the time, which I don't fully get uh, why they wouldn't take that extra time to make it a audio unit as well or whatever. But um, but yeah, lots of great. Lots of great stuff. It's just to me, I feel it feels foreign. Like um, a lot of people have asked for like Serum on iOS and stuff, and it's not that I couldn't technically. It's just that I don't understand it. I don't, as I'm not a user, it's really hard for me to. I don't have much interest in doing that from a passion point of view, right? It's like a yeah, I wouldn't be a user. What is the the um what would you say like the barrier like why do some people make a vst and not an audio unit and like a 32-bit version of the thing but not a 64-bit and so on and so forth like what what is it that stops developers from doing that um the different plugin formats are all different code in a sense and so what people do a lot of the time myself included is you like when i was starting out and it's still i've still sort of been stuck in my way is you download the vst sdk um and that allows you to make a VST plugin. So you're like, okay, let me take the example that they give you and build that. And now you have a gain plugin. And you're like, okay, cool. I don't want it to be gain. Let me add some, make it do something different. Let me add some more knobs. So then you start adding knobs or parameters, whatever. And then, and, and you change the plugin name from gain to whatever your name is, right? So you're sort of incrementally just modifying this example into existence into something that's that's yours. And then at that point, you go, okay, ship it, whatever. And then um, people go, I want an audio unit version. And you're like, well, I don't really want to download the audio unit SDK and, and then like rebuild the like copy and paste everything and then have these two projects. So what most people do is they, if they're in my shoes, is they wrap the audio unit. So uh, wrap the VST into an audio unit format. So basically... It's kind of like having a mini host in a sense. It's just a, a middle layer that's translating the hosting the VST and then translating that out to the audio unit host with what the audio unit wants. So that's what all of my audio units are. They're wrapped VSTs, and that's very common. And then same with AAX for Pro Tools. It's a wrapped VST again. Does that mean the, that they would potentially run slightly worse than the VST because there's like a bridge kind of between them? So like slow things down a little bit or...? Technically, yes. Technically, it is additional code and there's an additional layer in there. But what we're talking about is like two or three operations per block call. And so you're talking about something that you could not measure on a CPU meter. It's so it's so insignificant compared to what how many numbers that an audio plugin crunches mm. that it's sort of like 
you know, ne- needle in a haystack in the in the sort of relative sense of how much overhead it adds. Um, but there is a, you know, there is more room for bugs or unique issues to an audio unit. And I always try to push my customers towards VST uh, when they have the choice, like in Ableton Live, um, but not really because of the overhead or any kind of issues. It's really because if they ever want to collaborate with a Windows user on Live, it actually works to just uh, move your project over if they're VSTs. Yeah, I had that that when I was working on Apple a lot because one of the things I do a lot is just collaborate so much. Um, and yeah, I, I just like didn't even have an AU folder when I was working on Mac because of that reason. Like it would just have so many incompatibility incompat- issues with collaborators. Um, exactly. Is this the, the case all the time with AUs? Like it, is it that, um, cause it's, I mean, I had never really thought about it or knew how this works, but I assumed that sometimes plugin creators would make an AU and then port it to VST or vice versa, but is it always VST to AU then? No. So, I mean, the most common way that people make plugins is using juice Mm. and uh, j-u-c-e and so juice is uh, basically it makes an abstraction for all plugin formats so you're basically writing an internal thing called audio component and it's sort of like a generic generic uh, juice plugin if you will it's just its own format you could say and then when you go to hit build it does the necessary translation so it might actually you know technically have a couple less process calls like I was mentioning because there's kind of no wrapping going on or you could say it another way that it's wrapping to everything it kind of depends on how you look at it I would actually think juice has more overhead with translations knowing what I've seen doing debugging with it and stuff um, it's very uh, likes to sort of verify a lot of stuff right so you do have like a lot of extra calls and um, so performance wise I think I'm actually kind of at a lower level even with wrapping to audio unit um, but I think it's actually negligible and a talented programmer could you know probably make it all um, unimportant I mean it's it kind of reminds me of like when you talk about audio engineering and someone says oh I want to get the best microphone cable and you're like okay well what kind of microphone do you have and what kind of preamp do you have and you're only as great as your weakest link, right? And so I think the weakest link is usually that DSP code and like finding optimizations there. It's probably what's gonna matter most for performance. And then there's the whole graphics side as well, of course, which similarly, there's ways to optimize and make graphics performance better. And so, yeah, doesn't matter what you would use. It's kind of like Mac versus PC or, Win- or uh, you know, DAW wars and that kind of a thing. I think it's kind of similar here. It's like. You can't really discuss it unless you start talking about what you're going to thrive in right. or whatnot, and and uh, the and the weakest link is typically not those sorts of discussions. Mm. Yeah, it makes sense. What? It, so, how did you become like a talented programmer? Because it seems like you didn't go to school for it, right? And it seems like you didn't um, like you came from a sort of rock engineering background and. You know, Pro Tools background and stuff like that, and then just got into coding when you were thirty. Um, like, yeah. how how did you manage to just go from sort of that background with no real like coding experience, from the sounds of it, to just being able to build one of the most flawless seeming plugins that exists? Thanks. I, I don't think it's really my strong suit is actually the programming. So there's, there's a few things. Um, one is that I grew up in Silicon Valley there and um, my dad was a researcher, um, retired now as researcher at uh, Stanford Research Institute. And so they developed the first artificially intelligent robot that was autonomous, very much like a Roomba, in fact, <laughs> except it was six feet tall and had a wire harness and then it ran in a vax terminal which is the size of a warehouse or a garage at least uh and they had to program it with punch cards so he was doing ai autonomous stuff where things could calculate trajectories and learn its environment by bumping into things and all that so you could look up shaky the robot and that was my my dad's thing way back um this up right and now. uh so i grew up in a pretty technically literate household we had commodore pets and i had a commodore 64 and i have an older brother who's incredibly gifted and he um is more in like network coding and stuff but basically our conversation right now is running through my brother's software kernels most likely because his mm. switches more or less power the internet for anything that needs a lot of bandwidth or a lot of a lot of uh yeah throughput and so oh wow um so yeah my brother is very talented um was like runner-up 
state chess champion as a kid. Oh, well. Could, could solve the Rubik's Cube behind his back while he talks to you. And it was just a photographic memory, like very exceptional. And I was a lot more normal, um, I, I guess. I mean, I always, I always felt like I, I have a bit of a... Um, what would you call it? A complex, I guess, about feeling like an idiot because my brother is so exceptional, right? And so you, you, you know, that's unfortunately how it is. I think being a uh, being a younger sibling, especially, I always felt like, oh, I'm just not old enough, and I'll I'll be as <laughs> smart as him or whatever. But it didn't quite happen, and then hence the getting long hair and dropping out of school and running away from home. I ended up in juvenile hall. I had a pretty messed up childhood in ways. Um, until I realized I can't feel sorry for myself because it was just, a, I think it was normally just a teenage emo phase. And I realized, you know what? I can do what I want. I don't have to feel like a victim. And I sort of just, something switched in my brain around 16. And I got a job at a music instrument store the next day after I had this epiphany. And I was like, I can do what I want. I want to do music. And then there was really no looking back until age 30, um, where I then started reassessing, you know, I haven't stopped and asked myself what I want to do since I was 16 and just had the blinders on like it's it's music or bust. And, you know, there's a there's a saying in hip hop, like you can take the kid from the ghetto, but you can't take the ghetto from the kid. <laughs> and I kind of think maybe the same with my upbringing, like you can take the kid from Silicon Valley, but you can't take Silicon Valley from the kid. Right. Like I just I just got interested in in the in like not wasting my brain away, I guess, ultimately. I was hitting record for bands, take six, and the drummers, you know, do, 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 do. And I just started thinking about the tools and the software that I'm using day in and day out. And I really wanted to do that. So there was a lot of motivation to, like, challenge myself with something new. And I think I had that upbringing, watching my brother sit there and code. And, you know, he would he would code in Pascal, and then he'd look at the assembler and then he'd go like, oh the assembler is not even optimized enough i'll go right into direct machine code and he's like 7f 3c like programming like on this direct low level and i'm you know it's well beyond my ability but i think i did get some osmosis of just like the concept of that you can you can type and you're not going to break things and that um you know, and got, you know, I wouldn't be where I am without Google, right? So it's like weird compiler error or whatever kind of problem. Uh, there's like, you know, Stack Overflow. There's these like, and just Google itself. You can generally, someone else has run into that same issue somewhere. So, um, yeah, I feel like, um, like we were saying before about like people just having conviction about doing things. I feel like if you have um, like the drive to want to do something technical, and so long as you don't have like some sort of you know, mental disability or learning disability or something like that, and you don't play victim and you're driven to do a thing, you can always Google something and figure it out these days. Like there's no real reason that you can't, right? Yeah, for the most part. Now, making a synthesizer is a little different than making a Hello World app, right? Like your first little app. There's a pretty big bridge between there. Mm. Um, but you know, it's baby steps, right? So I started with, a my first released plugin was called Bitmodder, and it was just, uh, just sort of like Redux and Ableton or whatever, you have bit reduction, sample rate reduction. And then there's a third slider that just multiplied those two signals. So you got kind of like this ring modi other weird thing. Um, and it was just a free audio unit only if I remember right. And, um, so that was just my cutting my teeth on sliders and a user interface panel and like and getting to know kind of what's what's required for something like that. Arguably, Serum is just taking that same idea and just adding and adding and adding. But there's certain parts that are more difficult than others in my mind. One would be um, filters and another would be quality, like oscillator quality and that kind of a thing. And so those were the two biggest technical challenges for me with Serum. Otherwise, it's just a really big thing. And then there was just a lot of design decisions that had to happen and and get retooled over and over as I realized things were still messy or whatnot. And so, yeah, the hardest parts, I, I asked for help because that's, you know, again, the internet kind of came to rescue me. It's like I, I had friends especially back from back being a user and purchasing plugins, I had friends who were developers, so I could hit people up and say, hey, I, you know, I've, I need some filters or um, do you have any filter code that you might give me or, or sell me or license me? Um, and then similarly with the oscillator on Serum, um, I, was, I, you know, I was looking 
at a white paper that um, this mathematician slash plugin developer, uh, Laurent Dussoris, who's sort of the brain or was the brain behind Ohmforce. I think he's left mm. there now, but um, but I hit up I hit up Laurent and I was just like, hey, uh, this white paper is amazing, but I see it's from 1992 or whatever it was. Um, maybe you have even better code because even this isn't as good as say when you measured it versus massive, it still wasn't quite there. And he was like, oh, oh yeah, no, I can. I think I can beat what's out there with some changes. And uh, so I just uh, you know paid Ohmforce. I don't know, just a few thousand dollars and um, had that problem solved. Um, you know, I, you know, part of me wishes I could just know everything and do everything myself. But I think ultimately there's that weird thing where even your music, right? Would your music exist without Ableton and the, and the, and the coders behind it? Or and would Ableton exist without the hardware engineer? Like we're all a society. And, and so there's, I don't know, I think ultimately design like when actually I remember when I brought Serum, I was very proud when I finished it and went up to Thanksgiving and visited my brother. And, and I was just like, yeah, I finished my synthesizer. And he's like, oh, that's cool. Uh, how did you code oscillators? And I was like, <laughs> oh, well, I kind of licensed some code for that. And, you know, I did the whole design and these warp modes. And, and he's like, oh, but you didn't code like the the cur like the kernel of the. And I was like, y yeah, no. And he's like, oh, so you're more of a designer. <laughs> and I, I like I was like kind of like defeated by him saying that. And I was like, no, you're right. Yeah, I'm more of the designer and I'll, I'll wear that badge. Right? <laughs> I mean, I think there's something to be said though for like being able to take something and give it good application than actually making the thing itself, right? Like there's a lot of programmers out there who make these like really impressive pieces of software, but they're not able to apply it in such a way that any normal uh, technically illiterate person could ever use it you know um like any anything yeah. less than a programmer couldn't figure out how to get it off a github repository and install it and use it right so it's like there's something yes. to be said i think for taking those ideas that your brother might be talking about like these really impressively coded kernels for oscillators or whatever and then yeah. actually putting them into a user-friendly skin and you know executable file that someone can click on and turn into a sick dubstep base that's right. Exactly. I mean, I was not happy with the synths on the market and I wanted to make one that I wanted to make sounds on. I mean, that's really the impetus behind Serum by and large was like, you know, I'm watching Skrillex and all these guys use FM8 and Massive and stuff. But then I look at, then I try like, I don't want to make a bank of presets on these. Like, and so it was sort of like, well, why not? And that was sort of part of the impetus behind Serum is like, well, I want to see the wavetable. Well, I want to draw the wavetable. I want to import a sound to a wavetable. I want to have a little bit more visual feedback on like where and where the phase of an LFO is, or where the point on the envelope is, or uh, <laughs> give me envelope times at least. And so there was just a whole lot of things that made me feel like really frustrated trying to make sounds on other synths. And so I really made a short list in my head of, of those things. And just that's where I started. I started trying to do the things that um, were going to make me want to make sounds. And along the way, making Serum, I, I thought, wow, I think this is really working. I'm actually having fun every time I open up the prototypes. You know, I'm really having fun. Like I get lost making presets in a sense. And then I thought, you know, I bet I wonder if once this is out, if people will make their first ever bank of patches mm. for a synth. And um, that happened to a bigger degree than I ever expected. Um, obviously, the popularity happened to a bigger degree. But I also think that that was sort of a feedback loop that all these people making presets for Serum were, in essence, advertising Serum. And I've never advertised Serum once, uh, you know, um, short of maybe talking about it on stuff like this. Mm. Um, so that really was more effective than I expected. And I, so I think part of Serum's success is or a lot of Serum success is due to the accessibility of the interface. I'd like to think, you know, sonic decisions I've made and, and the curation of other people's DSP of it and that kind of a thing. But but by and large, I, th I think it really, you know, what my desire was, other people out there had that same want, which is something that's really giving them a visual understanding of what's happening sonically. How do you feel about um, these companies like, say, Cymatics or whatever, making like shit tons of money off sort of selling preset packs for Serum? Because I mean, like it's, I mean, it's, yeah, I guess like, how do you feel about that? Because I, I know how I, I feel about it from my I love it in a degree, right? People ask me, hey, am I allowed to sell presets for Serum? And I'm like, yes, please, of course, do your thing. Um, 
they're advertising my stuff. So I talked to one of the Cymatics guys and he's like, I can't believe you don't advertise on Facebook, Steve. You would make <laughs> so much more money. Like we, you know, we take $40,000 a month in Facebook ads. <laughs> and I'm like, what? Dude. Like that is insane. And he's like, well, yeah, but we double that back on revenue. Yeah. And I'm, <laughs> I'm like, and he's like, why don't you do it? And I was like, I don't need to because you are. People are seeing $40,000 a month of, of the serum being thrown in their face. And obviously they're going to, that's almost better than me advertising it. That right. just makes them feel like there's yeah, the serum They, they can't use there. their presets unless they get serum in the first place anyway. Um, I actually had a guy on the podcast recently named Kermodi who worked for Cymatics as a sound designer. And he mm -hmm. said at one point he was working there, he was the only sound designer working at Cymatics and they had like six advertisers working there. So it's <laughs> like a six or seven, six to one ratio of advertisers to, to actual people making sound design content. Yeah, you know, a few things come to mind to me. Like one is that like um, there's different ways to approach making a living or make or running a business. And, and I can't fault anyone that... Um, sees a certain angle it's really and it's always really hard to know what would have happened if you took a different way maybe if cymatics was a little more on the on the down low would they have more respect in the community i think there's some people that have a negative impression of cymatics not because of the of the products but serially because they're sick of seeing the ads or getting emails every day from them or something or, or whatever so um that's that's my tends to be my feeling is that um I've always had a, a much more like small minded approach, I think, which is that um, I've always approached my stuff as a boutique operation. I was like, is it just me? It's this one man shop versus like some huge company like Native Instruments or something. And so, um, you know, I kind of think I can charge, a pr my thinking always was, I can charge a premium and give people as, you know, personal support and free updates and this kind of a thing. and if I am able to gain people to um, think positively of me, they might refer me via word of mouth or they might come back for the next thing that I make and buy that. And so to me, kind of customer satisfaction and that personal one-on-one -on -one relationship was my thinking. And I think maybe I've outgrown that now in the sense of the popularity of Serum. I still do all the support. I answer emails and often, you know, within the hour or whatever I can, I, I'm, I really care about the customers um, being happy because they're the ones that have allowed me to get here or continue to support me. And so I think of them a bit more like clients. And um, I think it's worked well for me. I, I feel like there's generally a, not a negative attitude towards me. Um, or I, maybe I try to ignore, <laughs> no, <I would laughs> ignore say, those negative like, things. Moment. But generally people are like, Steve's nice and he's so helpful and responsive. Right? That's kind of all I've heard as well. Yeah, it's like every time I've like mentioned to somebody in passing that I should get you on the podcast or something like that. Or, you know, if anyone has ever said to me like, oh, have you ever chatted with Steve or whatever? And I've said no. They're always like, oh, you should just hit him up. He's super friendly. He answers all the emails himself. And, um, speaking of which, that leads me to, a, to something I wanted to ask you about, like just sort of what your day to day is like at this point. Because like you, you said, you do um, like before we got on this podcast, you said you wanted to do it before you dive into a shit ton of bug bug fixes that you were working on. And, um, you know, obviously you said you answer all these support emails uh, by yourself and you kind of like your own customer service team and, and whatnot so it's like uh, yeah what does your day-to-day -day look like is it just serum all day every day kind of just bugs and customer support or it's great i mean it's i really love my life it's like everyone in 2020 it's pretty isolated right i'm pretty much on my own thing but uh you know as of the last as of this year i mean largely my day-to-day -day is ch chatting with joel on discord and sending each other stuff we're, we're working on or jokes or whatever, um, chatting with some other friends and that kind of a thing. Um, I don't really have a set exact, like, this is what I do every day. So, uh, wake up in the morning, try to knock out all of those European or Asia emails that have backed up. And then once I'm done with email, it's sort of like, right, what to do. And I t tend to, um, have some sort of vague to-do list. So there tends to be something that I'm working on. Um, it's become challenging though, because of the popularity of Serum, the support has definitely increased. And so I'm gonna make a move probably this coming year to get someone to at least be a first tier so they can knock out the 
customer service stuff. Also, I now have 10 plus years of customers. So I have people going, I can't find my purchase. I don't know what email I used. I have that. Now I have that like three or four times a day mm. and it gets a little tedious, right? You're sort of like trying to help someone locate their bank transaction <laughs> or, or whatever. Um, so I would love to get that off my plate so that I could really focus on the uh what's best for all of the users and what's best for all the users is not putting my time on one user at a time, but rather what the users want and making the new stuff. So I'm um, working on a major new, major changes to Serum for this coming year. Um, Anything and, of that you can talk about? or uh, Well, when things aren't actually done, I don't really like to because sometimes I'll change my mind mm. or sometimes, um, yeah, it's that kind of a thing. But Basically, I want to increase the sonic palette of Serum without losing the essence of Serum. So, you know, by and large, the interface is going to be, uh, by and large, it's going to remind you of Serum very much, right? I think people have a certain, you know, motor memory, spatial relationship to it. And I don't really want to break that. I see no reason to try to make Serum 2 be this like behemoth. Mm. At the same time, I want a lot more sonic flexibility. So there'll be a lot of, a lot of new stuff coming. Um, I mean, you could pretty much look at any facet of Serum and say, okay, imagine that does more. And that's right. kind of what it's going to be. So a lot of incremental stuff. Um, and uh, I don't really know until it's done for sure, but I'm really excited because I found some collaborators that are going to help me do things that I'm not capable of. And that's like, to me, the like I, I think of Serum maybe like you think of as a piece of music or an album. It's almost like something external to you in a way, like a child or it's its own thing. Mm. And you're like, right, what can I put into this thing to make it be the thing it wants to be? And so I'm not like, precious in a certain way with, with me and Serum. I want Serum to be the thing that makes everyone who's purchased it glad they did because they're like, oh, my God, I can't believe how much is new. And you're, you could totally charge for this, but you're not. And that kind of a thing. Um, yeah, it's really impressive the stuff that you've done to Serum. Like the the updates, I thought that were insanely cool. The coolest one I think was being able to attach stuff to the LFO points. Like that was very useful, nice. I think, because it's just like, especially for techno stuff, right? Like growing things over time, where stuff opens up and then like shrinks back down into a tight sort of envelope again. Like that that kind of stuff was great. Um, and the other thing, I think it was something to do with using the noise oscillator as an LFO or something like. That is a yeah, noise is a mod source that's been in there for a while, but I, I have added some features in the wavetable editor where you can send your wavetable to the noise oscillator. Mm -hmm. And then, it, and so it's just very convenient if you want to have it just act as another, you know, periodic waveform, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And then of course you can modulate anything with that waveform at that point, once it's in the noise oscillator. So that the drag, you know, the drag export of, of the last played note, some people really love that. So they can just kind of bash through presets and, and just have a whole bunch of little sounds on the timeline that they can chop up and all that. Um, but yeah, I've done, I think, about 250 updates to Serum over its now long life, of, I guess six years or whatnot. Um, and it's it's grown into a lot of dead ends. So now this like last couple of weeks, I've just been tearing things down and trying to make, uh, get, getting a little help on that, thankfully, with some, some skilled people. But the... Um, Tearing everything down to to sort of make it the code more manageable and modular, um, so that so that the back end things aren't as difficult to accomplish. Because um, right now it's if you could imagine like a huge modular patch with like thousands of chords everywhere as an analogy. And I don't know if you've ever been in that situation, but you like pull one thing out yeah. and then it breaks stuff, and you're like, oh wait, what hole was that in? You know, and you're like, oh no. My whole patch is now met. And so that's what it feels like a bit of a minefield the way that I've kind of hardwired so much into place because I was just really spot building for my specific needs. Um, so, yeah, it's sort of a couple steps back to take a huge step forward. It's mm -hmm. kind of what's happening now. And uh, so super excited for next year. And, and um, yeah, and that's what I'm doing on the near term is just refactoring and getting stuff in place to then launch into a, some new creative spaces, sonic spaces. Hmm. So I have a friend that works at Apple as a security engineer on the security team there. And um, he's like mm -hmm. a, a really talented programmer. And I asked him the other day, I was like, what is it that makes somebody a really talented programmer? And he said, um, his answer was uh, interesting and I never really thought of it, but he was like, basically the thing that makes um, a really good programmer from like an average programmer 
is being able to sort of like hold um, hold things at like every different level of like every different layer of the code and realizing like how everything on all of those layers kind of interacts and realizing like you were just saying, if you pull something out of that one hole, how it's going to affect all those other things that it's kind of affecting or attached to or related to. Um, Interesting. And just like being able to sort of abstract on every layer like that, he said, is one of the things that he thinks makes a really talented programmer. Yeah, I, I, w- I guess I wouldn't disagree with him. I, I don't even feel like I'm a good person to, to he, he's probably better versed to talk about what makes a good programmer than I. Um, you know, when I was just getting interested in the VSTs, I had I was just doing rock records and I had this idea for uh, like a mul- like a very high resolution drum sample library. Um, and that ended up being F expansion BFD. So it was sort of my base idea. And then I did all these uh, drum kit recordings with all the different velocities and preserving all the microphone pairs so you could mix it like real drums. And there was nothing quite like it at the time. And it's it sold pretty good. And then so I um, was inspired from that um, to start getting into plugin programming myself, right? When you're like on an email threads with the developers and stuff, you feel like you're kind of getting your, your, your toe in the door, at least being able to peer in the door into what that life is, that world is about. And so I was like, I want to do what you guys do. <laughs> Where do I start? And um, or I asked, should I go back to college? Should I get like a, should, maybe I should take a few years and get a degree or something. And, and one of the programmers there said, no, that's really not necessary. Like the most, what you're going to learn from in school is how to interface with other programmers. They'll mm-hmm. teach you how to do proper like syntax and structure and this and that so that you can kind of all work together as a team. And that's how most software is developed. You have, um, you know, a team that are checking in, checking out of the repo with, and they're forking and they're making their own changes to their little section of the thing. It's almost like a bunch of people in a Minecraft world, right? Mm. Working on different parts of the map at the same time. Um, and I've ne- I never had that luxury. And his suggestion was, since you're just a solo guy, just don't bother. You, you don't have to worry about how things interface with other people. So, um, I think he was right in a certain sense, and you fig- you build your own mental maps of things as you go, um, and you build your own ways of doing things. And um, I, f- I feel a little bit like, I think Bill Gates said some quote, which I'll totally mangle, but that he basically said he'd hire a lazy programmer over another one because the lazy one's going to figure, yeah, figure really out. clever <laughs> ways to get things accomplished. And that's yeah. very much me. I'm incredibly lazy. Uh, and I just figure out these ways to, to make something work. And that tends to be a very efficient solution. Like it's not over-engineered. I'm just like hard patching, right? Mm. Uh, not great for maintenance, but it's definitely great for getting stuff down. Yeah. Speaking of maintenance and laziness and all that stuff, how, what, how's the serum code look? Is it like pretty messy in the back end? Do you comment it all out and like keep it all neat and easy to, uh, you know, you know, in such a way that it is easy to do updates in the future, or is it pretty much just like a dog's breakfast just everything's jammed into some text files and like yeah i'm a lot more monolithic than most people so i don't know if you've browsed a lot of repos maybe uh, a little bit right like you kind of look at the files on a github repo or something and Sometimes. generally you have all of these files that have very little content in them and in fact mm-hmm. that drives me a little crazy you're like what's in this file and it's like an include to another file and you're like okay what's in that file three includes to three other <laughs> things and you're like all these files are just here to include other files. Like what the heck? Like, oh, I can't even tell what's actually got code in it versus just like this management hierarchy thing. Um, so that, uh, I don't know. I'm a lot more like terrible in the other direction, which is like these huge monolithic files that have like everything, you know, way file loading and saving and all your automation stuff and your process functions and this and that. Right. And so, um, it's pretty messy from a, standpoint but i've you know i've had certain developers that like you know are trained went to school and they follow best practices and they look at the serum code and they're just sort of like yeah i can't even look at this and then i have guys who are um a little more seasoned and have seen a lot of code and worked on a lot of vsts for various companies and they look at serum they go actually this is really like you didn't do a very bad job here this is actually really easy to make sense of so it kind of depends on like if you're really expecting best principles of code structuring and stuff, it's a mess. But if you're actually talking about being sort of efficient and not over and just more direct to this is what it does and this is where it goes and you end up and you don't have a lot of stuff to chase, Serum is actually very to the point. Hmm. It could be the same as like project files and collaborating in that way, right? Which is some something that I'm pretty seasoned in and I'm not very seasoned in coding, so I can't really talk about that. But um 
Yeah, definitely. I, I notice when I get like project files back, if somebody puts all their drums at the bottom and then like their synths at the top or something, I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? It's like the way I go is like <laughs> drums at the top, then bass, then synths, then like effects, then vocals at the bottom, you know? So it's kind of like, I feel like I'm building like the base of everything from the top down to the thing that you want to hear on the top of the mix, right? And I guess yeah. like some people do it the other way. They put their drums on the bottom, then their bass, then that like and build up from the bottom up. But I, yeah, I mean, I guess it's just, um, like when I look at any project yeah. file of mine, it doesn't matter if nothing is named. I just know that that's the order in which I do stuff. So I just know where things are going to be. I guess it's right. kind of a similar. Yeah, that's a personal thing. I mean, I saw someone recently saying all DAWs are designed wrong. It was like clickbait, I guess, or whatever. And I was like, <laughs> I got to see what this is about. And he was basically saying that. He's like, no, the base is the lowest thing. So it should be at the bottom. But all DAWs start you at the top. So <laughs> and I'm like, this is so arbitrary and personal. Like, it doesn't really yeah, I mean, matter. That only matters if you like start writing your song from the baseline, right? Yeah, I guess so. I, I just, I, it, I don't know. Like to me, I, I can deal with the abstraction that tracks don't need to have a vertical placement. But I, I, I do think more, maybe more relevant to the code is like you will see people with like, you know, 120 track Ableton session with like every single one's just named audio 56, audio 57 or track 56, track 57. And then you'll see people with uh, and then they'll have just like one region or, or versus versus people that might be a little more tidy and organized, name all their tracks, group stuff together, even though they don't need the group there, but just to be like ergonomic right and so that to me is the closer analogy where, where like proper coding you're going to have those groups and things are going to be all well named and all of that and then my stuff to make the analogy backwards is is like my code is maybe not quite as like organized and tidy like i like to me it's like what matters is how it compiles and and all of the you know stuff gets out I'm pretty decent with variable names. I do that for myself. So some people just use a lot of single letter variables all over the place. And I, I tend to use a little more descriptive variables. But just for me to not have to have to go back and read my own code and be like, wait, what is this again? Mm. Um, so it just helps. And I, and I do make unnecessary comments, again, just to myself so that I, when I'm looking at scrolling in code, I can, I can see, oh, this is if this is missing, then do you do this or whatever. So... Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm so apparently I'm somewhere in between. Like, totally like by the book schooled coders don't like me. The guys that are actually really talented at making plugins think I, I'm actually doing a pretty decent job. So, it's awesome. somewhere in between. <laughs> yeah, nice. Do you think um, the genre rhythm would exist without Serum? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, I think it's definitely one of those hypotheticals. Like, would um, would would anything happen without anything? Like. I mean, I'm, I always have sort of the little bit of the cynical attitude of, well, maybe it would be a better genre without Serum or something <laughs> like maybe something else would have come. I don't know. Um, ultimately, from what I gather and from what people tell me, I guess the answer would be no. Like they say um, that, you know, oh, the reverb filter and this and that um, kind of thing, like, it, like the genre wouldn't exist without Serum and or dubstep 2.0, whatever that even means, because I actually don't really know that wouldn't exist without Serum. But you know, I don't. I don't really know. I, 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 uh, I, I think of it a bit like auto tune or something. Like maybe it's for better or worse. Like me, I can't say I, that the musical landscape is better because of it, because people would have made maybe different music or whatnot. So, um, but if if people are happy, then and and Serum was responsible, then that's great. But I don't. I definitely don't like. My head doesn't go into taking claim for something that wasn't really my creativity. Reminds me a bit of when I was you know pre coding and just farming out ideas to developers. I met this guy in Paris who made this software called Exincar, and it was like a beat slicer type of thing, like a beat reorderer kind of thing way back in 98 or something. And I just wrote him a pipe dream email. Hey, if you ever make another thing. And I just wrote him just this, like I was like stoned and just wrote him this like <laughs> long email of all that. Oh, make it with like eight of them and do this <laughs> and this. And then he actually did. He took my whole email and he turned it into this thing called Divine Machine mm -hmm. and added a bunch of his own ideas too. He's like, Steve, guess what I've been working on for the last 18 months? And it was like, <laughs> oh, my God, I, almost, I forgot about that email. Uh, and then I made a track with it and I sent it to him. And I was like, how does this make you feel? How does this make you feel to like hear this music made with your software? And he was like, honestly, Steve, I don't feel a thing. <laughs> I was, I was kind of like, what? He was like, it was your your decisions made that music. I didn't make that music like. I, I feel no personal connection to it. And then fast forward to today, and I've gotten emails from people very similar. Here's a thing I made with Serum. Like, how does it make you feel? And it's kind of the same. I'm like, well, you could have used 
if like I can't I I didn't make that music. You made the decisions. You picked the settings or the presets or whatever and the notes. And I just don't feel like I am in that music. You know what I mean? Or that it's mm. because of me that it exists. So yeah, it's funny to come first full circle on that because I definitely remember thinking like, wow, that you know, this developer that made this possible must like be proud of my awful breaks track you know <laughs> nope what do you um do you ever get emails for feature requests that you're like oh that's a great idea and put it in or is it mostly you coming up with those those features that you want to add to the thing and a lot of the emails you're getting are just like oh you should add another reverb filter or a sixth fucking oscillator or <laughs> Yeah, I do. I mean, there's been times where I've I've added a feature like on the spot. Someone says something and I'm like, I think I can do that. And I just go into the code. I mean, a lot of the process features in the Wavetable editor, for instance, a lot of the new additions, especially like take the phases from one frame and apply it to all the frames or, mm. or some of the other interpolating bins or phases uh, across tables and stuff. That, that was all... Uh, stuff that someone say, hey, would this be possible? Or like thin tables by half, right? Like, oh, I just want every other table. I'm like, oh, that's really easy. That's I can do that right now. Like and so I'll do it before I answer the them. email. And then I'm like, oh, I might as well send them a build. And so then, I, and so some people have asked things. And then like within an hour, they have a version of Serum that does that thing. <laughs> um, and I love that I'm able to do that, like that nimble thing that like a huge company could never do, right? Because that would go to the product manager. The product manager would assign it if they, you know, if it fit into the paradigm and all of that. So I love, I love the fact that I can do that. And um, so I do. Yeah, I'll I'll take ideas from everyone. But what I really like is looking for consensus ultimately. I made some mistakes like early on. I had a plugin called Lucifer, and then I had a customer that wrote me and saying, "Hey, can you add a knob that like does this weird thing?" I can't remember what it was exactly. And I added it, but there wasn't room on the interface. So now there's this this knob kind of floating on the interface. And then everyone's like, what's that knob do? And that's such a weird feature, you know? And so I, I kind of learned early that like, you can't just like stick stuff in without trying to keep in mind that simplicity is part of the, part of what makes any music tool good is the limitations are actually kind of some of the strength and you don't want to mm -hmm. just overwhelm people with option anxiety or you know, yeah. especially back in the day i remember there's a lot of like freeware synths and stuff and i download them and it'd be like a huge wall of knobs i'm turning knobs but the sound's not changing because those knobs only change if that knob is set this way you know right, and this right. is and it's very frustrating so i always have you know i've always tried to keep it you know and you know an eye on trying not to just make things you know feature rich just for the sake mm. of you also i guess having a lot of stuff need to think about the fact that there's just so many users right like i'm thinking about this from a perspective of like ableton right i've, I've posted in forums a ton of times being like ableton should totally have this feature like why the fuck have they not implemented this and like and then you know somebody else will uh respond in the thread being like well you know i use ableton for triggering things in theater performance and this would actually be like kind of annoying to have that feature or whatever and i'm like oh shit i never really thought like you know not everyone's using ableton to make bangers like i am yeah, I respect the Ableton design team. I don't know how they really do their process, but I really feel like when people request things, they do take note, but then they, they take time to figure out what's the best implementation, like what's the most Ableton-like way to implement this thing. And they so they don't really try to rush out and get in the DAW feature war, but they do definitely keep in mind like how to take in the various ideas and either redesign or integrate things in a way that it's not that it's not clutter and it's not overwhelming for users so um yeah they've been kind of a source of inspiration in that way of how much power is in ableton but then you compare it to like logic which has menus and then menus above the menus and then each menu has lots of sub menus and you know it's just like uh it's it's kind of overwhelming in a certain sense uh to be they've actually done a good job with logic i think refactoring it in ways but um still simplicity with power is one of my mantras i want to make something uh you know, that allows people to kind of go deep, but when they're, f maybe it's their first synth, or maybe they're just in the, in the moment making music and you want to kind of make a sound, but you want to also keep that like idea of the fact that you're making music and not in a sound design session. That was really part of my thinking with Serum because that was me in a lot of music sessions where it's like, I want an original sound. I don't want to just surf presets, but I, and I have an idea in my head for the sound of it, but I don't want to get taken out of the music making mindset and just go full sound design mode. Um, mm. I think a bit 
a bit like being stoned or something. It's like if if you're like you know short term memory loss is kind of similar or something, right? You're like it can't be too difficult, be, or because you're going to get taken away. Like now you're in this different weird space, and so it's better to just have this sort of like, um, you know where things are and all of that um, kind of a thing. So, yeah, I had, I had another point in there from before, but it's gone now. So. Yeah, no, I agree. I think um, the way Ableton does things is like pretty clever and neat. I, I like that they, um, yeah, they don't like overly do the menu thing. I think um, the, the company that's probably the worst at this, and not to say that this DAW is bad, uh, mm. it's, it's, it's extremely powerful, but um, Fruity Loop Studio, it's like, because it started, I think, as just, you know, like a drum machine. And then they mm. just kept like building on top of that and on top of that. And you can kind of tell it's like, they didn't really think of a way to like integrate all of the stuff into what it is today and instead just kept adding to the original thing rather than rebuilding it or thinking of a thing like an overall picture from scratch and you know so for instance it's like the mixer and the arrangement page are like not attached you have to attach them manually channel by channel for instance you know like that's yeah clearly yes yeah. because they, i like, was built early on with fl design like not in design i was a beta tester for fl back in like 96 Seven, nine, no, 98 maybe so it was like fl3 or four um and that was an interesting one because i remember them it was basically it started out kind of as one programmer who's no longer working with them i don't think um gall and he he would talk about how like if he changed a hot key for export midi there would be people that would freak out right <laughs> like alt shift m no longer exports my midi what the hell <laughs> and this is something that you kind of face as a developer is that when you change things you're going to have people that are going to say it's it's worse now. Like I, I liked the way it used to, I was familiar and comfortable. I'm just going to keep using the old version because I like the old way. So they're kind of stuck in that quandary a bit where there are users um, that really want just the simplest way of FL, right? Just make a step sequencer XOX drum beat and, and then they sell it on their Beats website or whatever, right? So they have these people that want this simplicity. And then you have obviously like the average user that knows that the piano roll is just sort of an inevitability and is jumping into that a little sooner rather than later. Um, and I, yeah, I struggle with FL for the same reason of it having a bit of a schizophrenic kind of design. Um, they've made a lot of good decisions, but and I'm very impressed that people put up with the interface or learn it. And then, and then at that point, that becomes their preferred thing. You know, I, it's a number of EDM producers that are quite successful that have done basically all their work in FL. Um, but if you ask me to mix something in FL, I would tell you to get lost. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what, what would you mix things in these days? Because you, you said you were a Pro Tools user from way back. Um, but like, what, how do you feel about Pro Tools in 2020? You feel like it's dated now or do you feel like it's kind of uh you know still got its place in studios because i mean like my thought on it and this is not to say that pro tools is bad but i feel like it's kind of a legacy thing right it's like you just need to use it to be a part of the cool kids club and work in the cool kids studios and be in the big studios with the big engineers sort of thing you know it's mm. it depends what you're doing right so specific to mixing i think pro tools is pretty sweet like you could mm -hmm. you could argue that um you you might know something that's better uh, if you want a lot of I.O. count, you know, like 96 ins, 96 outs, patch in all this outboard gear, low latency inserts, you know, you get like a seven sample latency so you can patch in compressors and all this stuff. The hardware is great and you can't do that in most DAWs. You can't integrate the Pro Tools hardware. So it still has this high end niche for the people that need a ton of track count, a ton of I.O. Um, still has a good point. You want to record 96 channels at once. You know, it's a good system to use. Uh, and I also think it's probably the best audio editor. Mm -hmm. If you ask me to chop up thousands of drum hits in a DAT record, or DAT recording, in a recording you had of, uh, or whatever, like I would use Pro Tools for that. I did BFD, all the drum recording and editing of BFD in Pro Tools. And I had to export over BFD and the expansion libraries. I exported it over a million trimmed regions named in a specifically name scheme. And I would... I would dare you to try to export and trim and name a million regions in Ableton, right? It's mm. just There's forget. a way to do it with a Max device now, but yeah. I mean, it's just like to get those sample accurate start points, to correlate 11 channels or 18 channels of audio, to get that bust and printed out, yeah, you know, to get the 18 bust and printed down to 11 and, and all of this stuff and to do this in a way that's not going to drive you crazy with manual labor. Mm. 
Yeah. yeah, you would almost want to write software, and then you'd realize that that's not the way. Right, right. Um, that's a good idea. So yeah. Pro Tools is the best game in town, in my opinion, for dialogue editing, for for uh, that kind of a work, at the, you know, group, group track editing and, and all of that. I actually think it's probably still the best. Mm. Um, actually, but you when know, it, one thing music I... Music making is a different story. Yeah, yeah. One thing I really, really love about Pro Tools, actually, um, that I think Ableton or every DAW really should implement is tab to transient. I think that's a great feature. Exactly. That's one. I'm. That's one of the things that came to mind, as yeah, well yeah. as the just ta yeah tab to transient or even just tab to regions, right? Like yeah. I could have say I recorded a snare drum hundred times, and I was trying to sort the velocities because no drummer is going to get that velocity range linear. Um, so I, now I need to shuffle around these different drum regions, you know, uh, drum sample hits to get them in proper order. Um, and then being able to tab to the next region and same for the trimming, right? You could zoom in a lot and just tab and watch how the fronts, cause you really want consistency. You don't, you know, you don't want any timing deviation. It matters extra much when you're dealing with a whole bunch of, you know, correlated files, so to speak, that mm -hmm. someone's going to be triggering from a single MIDI note with different velocities. You don't want any <laughs> accidental groove mm -hmm. going on with your poor sample start trimming. So, um, so yeah, using that tab, tab to, tab to region, I was really using more than tab to transient, but then shuffle mode, right? It also keeps things nice and tidy. So you could trim the region and now you don't have a gap between your two. It just snaps them all together. Yeah, so that's a nice I still think Pro Tools is best for audio editing. I could argue it's one of the best for mixing, but to really answer your original question is I, I, I was mixing for a lot of clients in Ableton Live. And I did like Will I Am and Justin Bieber. I did a um, bunch, a bunch of like big artists, a bunch of big EDM artists and stuff like that. And I would mix in... Ableton and I beat out like on Will I Am uh, single that like yeah you know, it's my only number one as a mixer but that um, uh, I beat out five guys that were that did traditional mixes in SSL rooms and I just did it all in the box with with Ableton uh, because ultimately you know the tools aren't what matters and I think you might know this as you 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 might have experienced this as you develop musically and and technically you go like actually I could make a decent program I could make a decent tune in this other thing I'd have to you know, I'd be a little slower trying to like learn the ropes, but, um, Oh, you can make a decent tune in anything for sure. Like we're going back to the conversation before I've made decent sounding tunes in $5 iPhone apps, you know, like nothing I've yeah. released, but I mean, I've sat there for, you know, half a day messing around with an iPhone app before and made a tune in it. Not, not the best tune I've ever made, but it's a tune, you know? <laughs> yeah. I think the weak link is us kind of ultimately when it comes to this stuff, your experience, your ear, um, when, it, when you're starting out, especially, it's really hard to know when is it right, when is it wrong, and, and to trust your own tastes and trust your own judgments can be very difficult. And then I think the more that you have experienced making music and all that, the more that you can kind of have a mental idea in your head, this abstraction of where you want it to be, and then you have something that's coming out of the speakers and that's on the screen that's, that's differing, and then you're able to kind of make that assessment of where that disparity lay and, and, and steer the computer towards your target and um it's just musical development i guess and I, th I think that that's i don't know that's what comes to mind for me in terms of uh the weakest link mm -hmm. is general people love to have daw wars but they can't make a good song or they love to compare synths and have a synth battle of what synth is the best when it's like ultimately like dude this is just you're just wasting time and this is kind of a <laughs> false making false equivalences and like it you can use anything and make great music. You know? Yeah, absolutely. So with all the mixing stuff that you did, um, like you said, you did some number one stuff or you did a number one thing for Will I Am and you obviously like mixed Nine Inch Nails and all that kind of stuff. Um, was the deals you were getting for those kind of things uh, generally just like a s flat fee or did you end up getting publishing and stuff on any of those? Or like how, do, mm. how does that kind of work? No, pu no publishing. I, I right. never, um, I never, I never aimed for that. I'm, I've always been a, when it came to like studio work, I always just thought of it as a general tradesman. Like, mm -hmm. just give me my premium day rate, and I can work six months, uh, six weeks on your record, and now I'll have enough money saved up that I can spend the next six weeks playing video games and <laughs> fooling around in music software on my own music or whatever. So mm -hmm. that was always my thinking. It was just like, uh, just get a good day rate. And so Nine Inch Nails actually didn't do mixing for it. I spent two years uh, working for Trent, and I was basically like a kind of a roving guy. I would do various things. I'd, he'd go in and hit cardboard boxes or whatever, and then I'd be the guy that chopped up all the samples and got them in folders 
to get loaded into the hardware samplers, or I would uh, hit record for him to loop record vocals, and then you know he'd say, oh, "I'm going to go play video games, pick out you know comp it together, pick out the good <laughs> the good ones." And so I'm like, "Oh, holy shit! I'm picking the freaking vocals for the Nine Inch Nails record," you know. So it was all very cool to me at the time. But yeah, then I ended up doing a lot of sound design, preset making, making reactor instruments that would just be weird and uh, patches for a lot of different hardware synths that he owned. And so he would just kind of give me a task and then I'd spend the next week or whatever it was on just that thing. That's awesome. Sounds like a cool job, just being Trent's right-hand man to doing a bunch of weird shit in the studio. It was amazing. It was, I mean, it was one of my favorite artists, like Downward Spiral was like my favorite album at the time when I, mm. when I ended up getting the gig. So it was like one of those like too good to be true kind of moments. And then I ended up learning a lot from Trent and Alan Mulder. And I learned uh, a lot from Charlie Clouser, who's just amazingly talented and, uh, and, and just super forthcoming with, with knowledge and info. Um, and so I learned so much from those guys, but then I also learned a ton more than I intended or whatever. When, after the album was done, after those two years, I realized that I had learned a lot just from my own work, right? When you're spending 18 hours a day using the software and the tools and you're trying to do creative stuff, you know, you can imagine, like, I'm sure you've, you've learned that way yourself. It's like, just learn by doing. If Trent says, make me a hundred piano sounds, well, by sound number 80 I, i've learned some tricks and i've learned i've learned some stuff about this this synthesizer that i didn't know and mm. uh, all of that yeah i had that experience with vital actually like very recently because i made a uh, 60 presets or 70 presets for it and yeah the mm -hmm. first couple i made i was like oh, this synth feels kind of weird and then by yeah like preset 30 or 40 i was like all right this is now a thing that i feel comfortable opening up and making a sound in in about two seconds yeah, different tools have different like bars of entry or, you know, it's the simplicity with power that's all, always try hard to hit, right? Like you, mm -hmm. you want to make something that's powerful and flexible, but if stuff's hidden away, people aren't even going to know about it. And now you've just made this feature that only three people know about or use. And so I think, um, yeah, I think a lot of my software kind of suffers that in diff different places. There's things that even the power users have no idea you can do. Um, and yeah, that holds true, I think, across all of my plugins. Um, Who do you think is the biggest power user of Serum? Oh, God. I mean, the one that's probably impressed me the most is probably AU5. I was about because, to say that too, like, yeah. <laughs> his tutorials are so, like, I, like, I love his his way of speaking and mm -hmm. I love his kind of mannerism and I, and I love what he does. He comes up with these like tricks or whatever, Crazy where I'm like, tricks, well, that yeah. wasn't something I intended. Yeah. There's a lot of talented users of Serum, but a lot of them color inside the lines where I kind of intended things to be. But mm -hmm. he's one of those guys that kind of goes a little outside of, uh, you know, he's, a, he's, he finds creative things to do with, with the options provided. And that's always like the most interesting to me. So I don't, I, you know, Who's the biggest power user? I don't know. I know various people who say they claim they've used Serum more than me, and I'm, I'm always not sure. I'm like, I don't know. I mean, yeah, I've been <laughs> on the on the ugly code side of it a lot, but I've spent a good number of hours in Serum. But some of them might be right. Um, I don't know too much. Uh, I don't. Yeah, I don't really know. I mean, one funny thing is that I don't really spend much time like like watching Serum stuff too much because it's a little cringy. It's like it's like listening to someone review your album sometimes or something. I don't know. It's sort of like I'd just rather not do this right now. <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to hear this. Um, yeah, watching people use or, or tutorials in particular are a little cringy because people describe things in ways where you're like, "Oh, that's not correct," or "There's a better way to say that," and all that kind of a thing. But right. Um, yeah, the things that really impressed me that Austin has uh, done tutorials on the two big ones I can think of is one is using serum effects as a volume shaper by using the distortion unit in it to sort of um, put the transfer curve to zero and back using the dry wet and then sending like an external instrument device into it from, yeah. from your drum MIDI, which that's is not, yeah, that's not necessary anymore. But uh, you, right. now I have, because of that video, I was, I added audio into the noise oscillator and you can just drag just the noise oscillator volume. Nice. Yeah. Oh, right. Of course. Yeah. Um, so that, and then uh, the other one is like the DC offset thing he did with, I think it was the LFO or the oscillator. And then he sends the DC offset out as CV. Yes, this one I did kind of intend and kind of messed with a bit. Um, LFO tool actually started because of Joel Deadmouse. He wanted a uh, way to control his modular synths. And mm -hmm. so he's like, Steve, how hard would it be to make like something where I can draw my own curve? Because there was a plugin called, uh, I don't know, Expert Sleepers was the company oh, that made it. Silent Way? Silent way, yes. Okay. And so 
So he was like, well, this plugin's really cool. It syncs to the DAW tempo, but it's only like saw, sine, triangle. He's like, how hard would it be to make something I could draw my own shape? Mm. It's like, I think I could make that into a plugin. And doing that whole node-based uh, LFO graph was the biggest challenge for me because I, I had never dealt with, you know, exponential curves and whatnot. And so um, in that way, at least. And so I think I did it in two or three weeks. And then I saw the Silent Way website with this like compatibility grid of what sound cards DC block versus which don't. And I was like, oh, I don't really want to deal with that support and people wanting refunds because their sound card or whatever modular nuts might want their word voltage biases or whatever. I was like, <laughs> that's no fun for me. I, I'm not a modular guy. Um, I'm an in-the-box guy. So I was like, okay, um, what can I make it do instead of CV? And so I made it, so I got rid of the CV, which was the whole entire point of the thing to begin with. And then I did volume filter panning. Mm. Uh, but uh, LFO tool, I have kind of done and used that. I think it was uh, VCV rack. I, I put Serum in VCV rack when they added plugin hosting. And I was using Serum exactly, I guess, like uh, Austin's doing it to uh, just send a CV signal out to control other stuff. Yeah, that's a cool idea. It's cool that you added that functionality. I would have never like thought that, that that was something that I really cared for as a feature, but now I know about it as something I'll probably use a bunch. Yeah, it's a neat hack. Yeah. There's another cool thing that you can do. I can't remember. Oh, that's the thing. Um, You use a... This is kind of like not this. You could do this with like a bunch of stuff. You could do it with Faceplant too, but something that um Scope showed me the other day is you set the noise oscillator to be uh the volume of the noise oscillator to be modulated by an lfo so you can change the just what, whatever the volume coming out of the noise oscillator is uh mm -hmm. and then you put a convolution reverb after it and then just like load anything into the convolution reverb that you want and then mm -hmm. by creating this like kind of complex lfo shape which is essentially like a hi-hat pattern going into the mm. convolution reverb, you can kind of take like any hi-hat sample or any sample you like and turn it into like a nice controlled percussive sound. Neat. Yeah, I've done that exact sort of sound design stuff. So I think I know what you're talking about by kind of just almost re, re, re granulizing or re, re, re uh, yeah, really sculpting the shape and using the crash symbol can now become a hi-hat or whatever, right? right? By just using a little piece of it and, and doing some kind of rhythmic gating or, or just single envelope on it. Yeah, conv and convolution on drum samples can be good fun. Um, yeah, interesting. I'd, I'd love to hear more about that. Um, let's see if there's anything more to that would integrate internally. And in, um, as I'm cobble, I'm trying to really just finalize what I'm going to do for Serum Two, which is not, which is just sort of a silly thing. You know, it's like I don't advertise. I'm not worried about marketing. But there's a certain point where it makes sense to just sort of add a whole ton of stuff at once and 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 because there's fundamental things under the hood and fundamental things that are going to require user interface changes it makes sense to do a whole bunch at once so yeah if you or any serum users have some stuff like the next month or next month or two is a great time to to spit it out but i have a pretty good idea and some undertaking on what's what the direction is but of course it's a great time to see what else fits in yeah definitely some convolution reverb in there would be cool i think on it <laughs> nice <laughs> yeah that's something i've been doing on like almost every sound lately is putting like m convolution easy or whatever on like most shit just to mm. give everything that little bit more space like because you don't want necessarily like reverb reverb on everything because it's like too much and it'll just like sort of end up muddying your whole mix right but putting mm. just the tiny sort of like three millisecond small room convolution type stuff on a lot of stuff can can just give it that extra polished bit of you know, so stuff in electronic music, it's very easy to make stuff sound too dry. So I think, yeah. like, you know, that kind of fixes that problem a little bit. Yeah, it kind of gives sounds their own space. And especially if they're like a stereo process, it can really, it can really kind of give, give things some placement where your brain has something to kind of help decode and separate. Um, the, yeah, really short IRs are kind of my favorite use of convolution reverb. As you probably know, you have to do kind of some kind of modulation to something without it sounding like a facsimile in a way. Like if you take a good church IR or something, it's sort of like after time, it kind of is a little grating because it's so static in a way and you kind of start sensing that static imprint. But um, it's still there with shorter IRs and in fact, maybe more so. But it, it, there's something about that frequency plus phase adjustment that happens from a like a cab IR or whatever. That's just really cool to me. It really imparts a lot of tone color and it's not just frequency response, right? It's, it's tweaking all the phase response. So you get mm -hmm. this like 
new flavor of whatever that sound is of it. So yeah, mm. I've been a big fan, fan of that. Yeah, the other thing I would suggest for Serum is like something like Disperser. Like I know Serum already has an all pass filter in it, but it doesn't quite have the, the uh, color or the tonality that something like Killer Hearts Disperser has. And that seems to be something I've been putting on sounds like a lot. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Which, yeah, I hate, I, I cringe on feature requests that someone else's thing because it's always like, oh, yeah, that's course, like yeah. not fun for me, right? It's like, you should do what such and such does. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, they are, A, they already do it. B, right, it's not right. inspiring for me if I think too much about the other product. But the concept, absolutely with you on. There's the all passes, which, yeah, is, is technically similar, but it's more like one setting, right? It's mm -hmm. sort of like, a, a, it's sort of like eight. Uh, nested all passes where theirs is n nested all passes i believe mm. um so yeah i'll uh i'll try to see if there's a sensible place to get something in that lets you do those sorts of things like to me it's always fun if there's some wiggle room to like do something creative or new and like mm. make it like this but also do it make it also do it like that is that possible that's always more fun to me because then i'm like oh what about okay, uh, now, th now there's a new challenge or there's something to solve rather than mimicking or, or just trying to like bite something right so yeah something uh, i've but, done a little bit of with a disperser is racking them up in ableton effects tracks and um you can hmm. set like the uh the position of the pinch to be like a note right like f or e or whatever and then mm -hmm. trying to make like a chord out of like three or four stacked ones Nice, making wow. the resonance pitch yeah. like really sort of like the resonator, but with with like much more fancy filter. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Yeah, that's fun. I'm not sure I'll get the polyphonic one in there, <laughs> but we'll we'll see what it can do. Mm. <laughs> that's that's a cool that's a cool idea though. Yeah, usually my go to these days for sound design, if I put like a new plugin on something, and I'm like, eh, sounds like kind of cool, is uh, what will it sound like if I duplicate it fifty times, and then like just have 50 of them in a row to be like, what does this now do? You know, like for instance, 50 disperses in a row. It turns something into this big, like, like this huge, like, bassy tail and sounds all big and squelchy and lasery. Yeah, neat. Yeah. I mean, I've definitely toyed with doing things like that back in the day, but it's, it's unwieldy, of course, right? Like, it's <laughs> so hard to manage that. I mean, someone could almost make like a little plug-in host, right? Like a sub host where you, it just does that for you, right? And mm. instances, and then allows you to do stuff like control all of the cutoffs or whatever it is across all the instances with a macro. Oh, just a auto idea. automatically do it. That would be a really easy plugin to make, in fact. Hmm. Uh, so just maybe someone like, listening to take this. Take whatever this is in X50 and then yeah oh. and then macro them and maybe with a spread pram right like i want i want to have each one be not exactly the same setting but fan them hmm. or something like that would be really easy to do in terms of automatable parameters uh for like a juice developer even a beginning juice developer could do that wow yeah um, i wonder why this doesn't exist <laughs> yeah yeah i think i think i remember some developer mentioning the idea to me and he's like oh i want to do that and but that was like a year or two ago and I think it's fair game. Hmm. Yeah, <laughs> you came up with it, not me. There we go. Yeah, man, now I have to learn Juice. Damn it! I tried to <laughs> download Juice once. I had a quick look at it and was like, "Yeah, fuck this." I, I also did like a some code camp thing online for JavaScript, and I got like halfway through it and was also like, "Yeah, this isn't for me." <laughs> yeah, you know what's funny is like to me, it's all about means to and like. My passion, I don't know, like I was never good in math class. Like you probably remember algebra one or whatever it was, like y equals x squared or whatever. And you're dealing with these function graphs. And like, I was just like, what the hell is this? Like, <laughs> when am I going to ever need this in life? I don't plan to build bridges. Mm. I don't like, I don't need this to balance a checkbook. Like, mm. what is this stuff? Right. And so it was, I was very turned off to learning mathematics stuff because of the abstraction had no application. And then it wasn't until I started getting into making plugins where now y equals x squared is actually sexy or exciting, right? Because <laughs> it's like, um, you know, this is, oh, x is input and y is output, and this is how it's going to mess up my waveform. Like, mm -hmm. now all of a sudden a function graph is, like, cool because it's a distortion, right, or whatever. And so now I'm, like, playing with all these math formulas trying to, see, you know, hear what these different things are going to do to a signal. And that's really kind of the level of stuff that I got bit by the bug on plugin developing was just exactly that, just distorting signals by using basic math functions. Um, yeah, definitely. And, I think like unless something has like a purpose behind it, it's hard to care about it. 
uh, with learning. Like specifically, I teach a lot of Ableton um, <clears throat> and generally the way I go about teaching it is start from the problem. Start from like, all right, here, I'm trying to do a thing. We hit this wall, can't do the thing. Obviously, we need to solve this thing if we want to get past this and do X, Y, Z things, right? So like then we go back from there, right? How do we solve it? Um, and I think like a lot yeah. of maths or a lot of stuff in school is not taught that way, which I think it should, right? It's kind of like yes. with, with uh, the algebra stuff. It's like if they had started by being like, all right, let's say, for instance, you maybe not a bridge, but like, you know, something that everyone wants to do, like let's something that's functional, you know, like balance, skateboard ramp, <laughs> something like that, or, something. or, you know, like a checkbook even, you know, something just like something to represent X and Y that isn't a bridge or like this isn't something that nobody thinks they're ever going to give a shit about, but something that everyone kind of universally thinks they're going to need to know it someday and then teach it from that sort of problematic standpoint, I think maybe be a bit more successful. Yeah, I do agree. I mean, it's, it's, it, why do I need to know this was the constant thought in my head uh, through yeah, most school, thing. you know, like names and dates and this and that. Why do I need to know this? Why do I need to know this? Is constantly what my rebellious mind was asking. And uh, yeah, it was weird to turn a corner. I mean, I'm really not the kind of nerd that enjoys programming. I see guys that, that actually really kind of enjoy various facets of it. Like it's a game or a puzzle to them. And to me, it's just like, a, it's a necessary thing I put up with in order to get the thing, the the result I want, um, and I'm much more interested in, and I all of my joy comes out of opening up Ableton or whatever test host I'm using and trying out this new feature and turning a knob and hearing something like that's the entire like rush and and joy for me is the and the progress I guess right you see the see just like a song or an album see it progress along. Uh, but even DAWs, even being a musician, it's like DAWs almost felt similar to me. It's like, this is the necessary evil that I have to put up with in order to make music with a computer. I don't actually enjoy using a DAW. And I'd love to address that someday. And I actually have some plans along those lines, but it's sort of like the same way Serum. I was like, I don't enjoy making sounds on synthesizers. Why not? And investigating that and trying to make it as fun as I could limited largely by my ability as a programmer um, mm. on what Serum is. I mean, there's a lot of areas of Serum I'm pretty kind of embarrassed about, but it was just, you know, best of my ability and and what a CPU is capable of, you know. Um, and so, yeah. And so I'd love to do the same thing on a more macro level in terms of just music making. Like, mm. I think one of the things that makes me have the most fun in a synthesizer, like one of the synths I've had the most fun in recently has been Pigments by Archuria. Mm -hmm. And I think what it is that makes it so fun for me is the sequencer. Like I, I just always love synths with a sequencer in it. Like also um, Zebra, Zebra 2 has mm -hmm. like a that uh, ARP sequencer thing that you can just attach to anything in it. And um, so yeah, se sequences that you can attach to all sorts of stuff. And like, especially if you can attach it to an oscillator that has like a quantization on the pitch to snap to, like you can set a scale for it to snap to, that kind of stuff. I, I have a lot of fun with that kind of stuff. So you'd like that in Serum, you're saying? Uh, yes. <laughs> so we, well, I have got news for you, but I don't have it yet. Okay. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, that kind of that kind of stuff is great for, especially stuff like techno, um, to like you know again create those sort of very uh, drum machine slash hardware machine type sounding sequences. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I've always had this weird disparity between a DAW and a plugin, right? Because it's it's this strange thing. I designed a drum machine called Guru, which was uh, F Expansion put it out and uh, years back. Um, kind of designed it and built it with a friend, and then they kind of took it over, uh, acquired it or whatever. And um, I had a lot of learning lessons with Guru because it was, it's sort of weird to have a sequencer inside your sequencer, right? It feels mm. a little redundant to have a. <laughs> something like that. Yeah. So that was one of the reasons I left any kind of ARP sequencer out of Serum was I felt like, well, you have the LFOs. If you really want to do this or that, you can kind of do it there. Mm. And you have the DAW if you have that. And you have stuff like Cthulhu or these other plugins. If you really want an arpeggiator, you can stick one before Serum. That has, of course, advantages like being able to use that same ARP pattern on, on layering multiple devices when you're stuck inside a synth, not so much. Um, so I left it off. And then also for CPU reasons, I was like, this is just going to make too many notes and <laughs> blow up the CPU. Now that I've got Serum a little more optimized, I mean, it's been significantly optimized since 1.0 and more to come on that front. And so I think, um, yeah, so I think now now for Serum 2, it makes more sense to get something that can 
get a little more spastic with creating notes. Um, but I hear you. Yeah, I, yeah. There's something that I've learned to enjoy the one note jam kind of approach, or the self-contained thing, where you in this one window, you can have you can have a musical idea that goes beyond a sonic one, you know, expressed. Right. Yeah. And there's also interesting things I think you can do the more you get into a single layer. Like for instance, if you have like I don't know one channel in your song that's a synthesizer with a shit ton of processing and just like ungodly amounts of automation on it and whatnot. That's essentially producing most of the song except for maybe the drums. And then you're able to just like quickly freeze and flatten that one channel and stretch it and reverse it and cut it up and all that kind of stuff. It's like kind of convenient and interesting to have just like so much density in one layer, then reprocessing that in other ways, you know, I feel like can have some pretty yeah. interesting songwriting and a sound design uh, effects to it. Yeah, it really makes sense. You know, different people work different ways. And I'm sure you've watched tons of people, students or, or whoever work. And um, it's weird how different people have different approaches. And it's, and it's important to keep that in mind, right? Like, it's it's like, I don't, I can't just go my way is the correct way or, or like, or whatever it is, right? And like, oh, that, I don't want that. Therefore, it shouldn't exist in my software. Mm. Um, yeah, like I said, it's always just about a j juggling the complexity, like trying to keep things simple so that that power can be there, but just as long as it's not crowding you when you don't want it. And another thing with arpeggiators, I really didn't like in synths. I don't know if you were back in the day with like Zeta and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. Okay, cool. Silent, <laughs> I guess, as well, where you have like you're scrolling through presets because you have a little riff on your track and you're like, okay, let me hear some different sounds. And then it keep, these arps keep coming up. And you're like, Oh, I like the sound of that, but oh, there's an ARP and oh, it's a mess to even just get that ARP shut off. Right. But obviously there's solutions for that. So I, yeah, you know. Just a button that turns the ARP off or something. <laughs> lock, yeah, like yeah. lock ARP so that if you change presets, it's still off, right? And right so, yeah. uh, so that's an easy workaround, but that was another thing that annoyed me with ARPs and why I didn't, that was one of my excuses I gave myself for not putting one in Serum. Mm -hmm. I was like, I was like, oh, yeah, then you'll have all these art presets that'll get in the way or something. Yeah, I remember back in the day preset surfing and like holding one note down on a synth and being like, how the fuck is this essentially a whole song like coming out of the synth, you know? And I didn't yeah. really understand these like crazy preset designs and didn't even know where to begin like deconstructing them to make it a useful sound for my song for sure. So, I mean, yeah. you kind of maybe it's just alienate. Like, yeah, it's like a show and tell but not a usable yeah, musical. Yeah, you might alienate like some beginners for that reason from using at least those presets. But yeah, I guess it's, again, like for, for someone like me, that's making a whole song in one synth and then destroying it somehow with effects and chopping and all sorts of stuff is kind of the thing that I like to do. I almost feel like you have to build yeah. these like crazy, for me, I always say like, I almost have to write like four songs to make one song because I, I just have to mm. keep creating like things to destroy them. Some different stuff can grow out of it. Otherwise, I just never feel quite satisfied with the end idea and never think it's like quite explored enough or polished enough. Yeah. I mean, I think that's what makes you really unique as an artist is that, is that your approach is not like other people. <laughs> and so, you know, this is one of these things where it's just not an absolute truth. Mm. Like, I think you can make brilliant music that is one dimensional. You know what I mean? It's oh, like a, yeah. a singer songwriter with a guitar or whatever. Like there's so many different ways to make music or I love a lot of the really simple tech house, like stuff mm. that's just like you know if they can have like four or five elements but it just somehow kind of works because they have you know effects swells or whatever that keeps it tension and release and stuff like that I, I'm, I'm a bit big fan of minimalism mm. but it only has a time and a place like i wouldn't want to you can't listen to that through your laptop speakers just not listening music in the, in the same way so that's one of the most interesting things about music to me is it just it has these different functions it serves uh, for a, a wedding or for a funeral <laughs> or for a you know there's like just a time and a place for different things and it's really hard to compare music that's intended for different contexts mm, yeah totally um yeah no i'm a big fan of simple stuff as well like when you're saying um you're a big fan of like simple tech house stuff like Kyle Watson comes to mind, for instance. Yeah. Huge fan right. of that sort of stuff for sure. And yeah, I mean, like I kind of envy, I think people who can uh, just write one idea and be like, that's the song, it's done, it sounds fucking great, it's super satisfying to listen to, et cetera. Because um, I, yeah, I just never feel like I yeah. can quite do that. With Joel, that's like our BSOD thing was all about that. So we made BSOD as like a joke because I had made this plug in Lucifer and it was kind of like Ableton beat repeat, but before Ableton had a beat repeat. 
And for that very reason, all of these DJs started buying it because they were, you know, people were starting to DJ in live. And then they were buying my Lucifer plugin so they could do flip the beat on a song that's playing through. Mm. And so uh, I got turned on to Beatport on its infancy by a DJ who is like, oh, yeah, I used to spin vinyl, but now I just get all my stuff on Beatport. And so I was like, interesting. And I was like, Joel and I were doing like IDM glitch stuff together. Um, not named BSOD, but we were just kind of collab collabing for fun. You know, we were both nobodies, so we didn't really have an outlet or anything. Um, and then I was like, Joel, have you heard of Beatport? And he's like, well, yeah, I've heard of it. Why? I was like, dude, just listen to the top 10. Like, we could make this as a joke. And that's exactly what we did. We made a <laughs> joke track. Like, this is the hook. And then that hit number one, which was crazy because we had no money, but yeah, no name behind us, just BSOD. This is the hook. And it was, I'm sure, largely due to Pete Tong, who had gotten a copy that mm. played it on his Radio One show. And so anyway, that um, that mindset we never lost, right? So BSOD was us just throwing something together. Don't overthink it it's just it's just art kind of a thing right like just don't don't torture ourselves and don't struggle and i think that's what makes the music kind of effective right because the it's you know electro house it's not trying to be highbrow um and it's music to party to like you're you're supposed you're supposed to just like it's and it, so it has this sort of light and effortlessness about it which i think makes it may, makes it kind of work so we didn't do, you know, Dead Mouse blew up and went on his own. And, uh, you know, we've stayed friends and, and collaborated on a variety of things. But um, we didn't do music for, I think, five or six years there or something like that. And then this January or February, I flew out to Toronto and, and hung out with Joel. And, and we we're like, we should make some tunes. OK, so we went in the studio and then we were both kind of like, how did we do this? Like, what was the process? Because so much has changed, like, since we last made some music. And I was like, dude, we were just trying to crank stuff out. We were doing two songs a day. We were just like, D just if something's cool, print it. Like just <laughs> next, 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 next. And so it's just this sort of just like go forward and like almost like, I don't know, like sp speed drawing or something, right? Like, mm -hmm. okay, the clock's starting. Whatever is done in four hours, that's the song kind of a mindset of it. And just don't overthink anything. Like, mm -hmm. and that's so fun. Like, it's so liberating if you come from a much more deliberate, like tortured artist, like long process mindset it's fun to just have things crank out yeah granted at the end of the day it might not survive the test of time or it might not be the music for all functions and some people might think it's trash but but um to me i, I love that idea of go in the studio and actually just have a good time don't like don't because i've had so many you know most of my studio life has been as a client or sorry i have a client and i'm just i'm just there getting paid to be there and to me, there's just sort of this work-like pressure of being in a studio that there's expectation and, and all of that. And there's something very fun about just going in and having fun and getting something done, because I'm sure you've had times going in a studio having fun, but no song gets made, right? Right, yeah. I think you can kind of feel that too, like at the other end of it, right? As a listener, even if you're a listener, I think with no concept of how music is made or anything like that, I think there's some like subconscious level at which you can feel if something has been sort of forced versus if something has been made just out of pure fun and it yes. kind of like exerts this uh like energy about it that's you know fresh and nice yeah and, as, and especially for party music what better mindset to be in right yeah than than like having fun and there's been so many hit mood. songs over the years that were that were just joke tracks right like beastie boys fight for your right to party <laughs> yeah. or girls like their two biggest radio songs were jokes that they were just blowing off steam before they made their real songs right, or, right. or after <laughs> or whatever yeah. and became the biggest things because it's like like they're having fun and that comes across and it's not taking itself too seriously and it's not it's yeah the effortlessness and yeah if it's party music especially it sh you should have a good you should be kind of partying making it and, mm, yeah that's a good point um so you do you and joel have two projects then because i thought the project you guys were in was called test pilot no, that test pilot is Joel alter ego. Oh, so that's gotcha, just okay. that's less like techno Joel. So what Joel ran into a bit was, which a lot of DJs do once you have that certain level of um, visibility or whatever. Like when you're one of those big names, people just expect is that something. People yeah. want they expect certain things from you. Yeah. Like if they're going to book you for a gig, they want you to play ghosts and stuff, or they want you to be, be kind of commercially or something. Like um, like he ran into that especially with Vegas gigs and stuff where. They're like, we're paying you so much. We want you to play David Guetta or something. He's like, dude, I don't do that. Like, uh, and then he's just playing like two hours of dark techno. And they're <laughs> like, 
you know, we have Saudi Prince here and he wants to hear some stuff with words in it. And Joel's like, oh, I'll give you words. Fuck, fuck, fuck. <laughs> fuck <you know? laughs> um, and so that I think he realized at a certain point I should, you know, um, I don't I don't know. Maybe it was done from a management point of view or something. I, I think it was just Joel. Everything's really Joel's impetus. But um, I think he's like, OK, if I want to do the really dark techno thing, I should give that its own name that way. People know what they're getting. They're not going to expect a mouse head, and they're not going to expect ghosts and stuff mm. and stuff. So, gotcha. test pilot is Joel, and then there's obviously the musical outlet too on that, where he's making music that more fits into that scheme of things. So, um, it makes sense to have multiple aliases when you see that there's sort of multiple art uh, outlets, right? Like, I'd love to be like the idealistic, naive. Uh, person and just say oh you can do what you want and people will love you and you don't have to think about anything mm. but in reality i think there is a certain people have expectations based on your previous output or people have expectations based on what they think you well, are yeah i mean how you package something up to somebody and give it to them is like uh very important and i mean a good example of this uh, is with food right like if you give somebody for instance yesterday i was eating uh, vegetarian chicken tenders and <laughs> i was eating them with a friend and uh he was like the I don't really like this, but if they had given it to me as fried tofu, I'd probably be like, this is great fried tofu, but because they gave it to me as a chicken tender, it tastes nothing like chicken. It tastes like flavorless as fuck. Like this is not, I don't feel exactly. good about this, you know? I've had this exact thought your friend had. Exactly. I, it drives me crazy when they try to make fake meat, like convince you. I mean, granted, they've done a good job with the Impossible Burgers and stuff like that, oh, but yeah. it's a burger. It's right. not saying like steak. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> Um, exactly. Don't try to pretend you're something you're not. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. 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 I understand that. So I can understand if, if um, Joel gets booked for a dead mouse set and then comes out and plays two hours of industrial techno or something, then people are going to be pretty unimpressed with that. Yeah. The audience might be disappointed. The promoter is probably disappointed. And yeah. And similar to your food, the food analogy similarly is like, say, like Coca Cola, right? Like if you're, um, I can't drink Coca Cola anymore for whatever reason, but if you, um, order a coke it's like you're ordering it because you expect a certain consistency you, mm. you kind of know what you're getting and if they if it was like grape flavored or something you'd be like what the hell and send it back <laughs> or, or whatever yeah. right so i think unfortunately i think people think of artists as the same thing and that's obviously i'm sure you've seen people struggle with that when they make music that's outside of their genre and people this isn't dubstep what the fuck is this trash you know because people don't really have an open mind they expect that consistency from that person so it really is better in a certain way to start a new alias and then people go oh no but my brand it's not gonna you know i'm not gonna get the same success from it if i start a new name well maybe you'll get more success than you ever had from your last one mm. or that you know you'll get that poly cross pollination from your fans that follow over into it and i don't know i you know i i kind of think do what's right first and worry about business second so you know i i don't know yeah uh, and then about business the generally money's not a problem if you ignore the idea of making money right yeah like worry about the packaging after you've actually made the art kind of thing i feel yeah. like people understand this food analogy to music um subconsciously anyway because everyone refers to music as like taste right they're like oh you have like this taste <laughs> in music kind of thing. right so yeah. it's almost like we use the same or we we do use the same terminology for, for food and music yeah i do think that sh like chef conversations are one of the best analogies to to talking about music you know it's yeah. sort of like you can love a spice but you can overdo it and etc you know it's like you need a sort of balance sometimes simple is is best sometimes things that just enhance the essence of what's there is a lot better than throwing a ton of spice on something i think there's a lot of analogies with like the way that our olfactory senses work and our auditory sense work that actually make it kind of relevant mm. yeah that's a good point hey man well it's been like really awesome talking to you we've been chatting for like two hours now so it's probably a pretty good place to end it so people are like, crazy yeah yeah right. i should i should get to this like list of bugs trying to shore up the uh arm version of serum that's coming up and uh it's it's just crazy to see these these new macs are so crazy fast it's just like insane just throwing 100 serums <laughs> you're just like watching oh, yeah. it, like, are you working on no, no fans kicking in you're like is this real life <laughs> wow are you primarily working on mac yeah, I prefer Mac a little bit just in terms of, uh, you know, the typical Mac-like interface stuff. And mm. so I, I do all the development on Xcode on the Mac, and then I'll just do the necessary porting changes over to the PC. And Yeah, um, I've heard Most Mac of my is... co code is really just agnostic. It doesn't, 
I try to stay out of the OS specific stuff as much as possible. Right. Yeah, I've heard Mac is slightly better for programming because of like the bash terminal and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's weird. You talk to different different nerds have a different different preference there. I mean, I know there's a lot of plugin devs that do do like Visual Studio or mm. one of these other weird IDs on Windows, but yeah, I yeah, the Unix folk seem to like Mac a little better. Um, mm. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, I guess there's also the other argument um, from some programmers that Windows is like your only other option outside of Linux and Unix and Mac and all that stuff, which is kind of all based off the same architecture, right? Yeah, exactly. I, I don't know. You know, I, I'm a nerd, but not that kind of nerd. Right. Is kind of <laughs> how I think about things. It's like I'm a music nerd and a synth nerd, and like the, the real nerdy stuff is just a necessary thing to get what I want accomplished. But um, yeah, I'm of the same mindset. That I think Joel said this. Um, where he prefers to use a Mac live because he can get like support from a genius or you know, get his Mac replaced under insurance really easily on the day of a show if he needs to or whatever, but prefers to use a PC in the studio because you get to pick all of your I.O. and like get to really customize your build for what you want to do in the studio. And if your computer crashes in the studio, it's not the biggest deal. You might lose one studio day, you know. Yeah, he's always been a PC guy to, to start with. And I when I when I really got into it, I had both going. So I had like you know, Mac and a PC with like so I just have the best of both worlds because there was a lot of plugins that were just either or. Mm. And it's like I want all the toys. So I sync the two machines with uh, you know digital I.O. 16 channel light pipe between them and everything. So I could just have everything. And I'd use the Mac as the tape deck and the PC more like the instrument because there was a lot more kind of like creative stuff at a, at a certain point there. Uh, long time ago, 20 years ago, there was a lot of creative stuff that only existed on Windows, whether it was freeware or some obscure granular thing or whatever. And now it's like, there's so much great stuff on either that's like talking about OS is just, it's kind of a bore, right? You're almost right. like, dude, who cares? Yeah, same as DAWs, <laughs> but, um, right? Yeah, no, but yeah, it makes sense. Macs are just a little more uniform, right? You just know that like, you, like the Coca-Cola or whatever, you go buy a Mac, you know, it's like, you don't have to worry about all the configuration or particulars. You just do that, install live, just click, 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 and now you're now you can get to your show. So mm. I do think uh, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, totally. All right, man. Well, yeah, thanks a lot for chatting and taking two hours out of your day to do this uh, on such short notice. That was really cool of you. Yeah, it was my pleasure. It was, it was great to meet you and finally connect. Let's yeah, uh, ch chat soon. Yeah, hundred percent, man. All right, have a good one. Awesome. You too. Hey, thanks for listening to the Mr. Bill podcast. These episodes are edited and uploaded twice a week by Robert Fumo of 303podpro.com. You can also support the show, get early access to episodes and hear bonus content by going to patreon.com forward slash Mr. Bill's tunes and becoming a patron. Uh, please rate and review on iTunes unless you're going to be a little shit about it. And all the links to my various platforms are at mrbillstunes.com. Thank you. Thank you.